Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective. Jordan's subjective perspective. <laughs> and things that play on the GABA GABA A receptors. Yeah. I was like, GABA A is more addictive to GABA B, but GABA B is more um, like just you don't realize how addicted you're getting to it, and it's just as bad as GABA A once it gets there. But like GABA A is quick. GABA A, you're like again like Xanax and shit. Two weeks on Xanax. So people are quicker to say that it's worse. Yeah, yeah, like okay. well, it's quicker to your body has an addictive response faster to GABA A than it does GABA B. Uh, GABA B would be like alcohol, and uh, uh, it used to be back when it was prescription GHB because GHB used to be prescribed for people for sex problems and for sleep and shit like that until they kind of labeled it as a date rape drug and uh, even though like okay you give somebody too much fucking GHB what is GHB a GHB um, it's kind of like between alcohol and ecstasy so it would be like but super like it makes you like oh, you know, like really, and once you get to a certain place, you just black out. You know, the blackout part of being drunk. But the thing is, is like, Rufalin was the actual date rape drug. It's just for some reason it got picked up by the media and really smeared as more of a date rape drug. But it wasn't really the one that was primarily being used. And so then it was taken off the market. And then it, you know, had a b black market presence. And I think it was just because, again, most things are put onto the black market because they can make more money. Um, so then GHB became that. So, like, a lot of people still, like, search out GHB just because of its beneficial effects for them in lower doses. Because it initially was prescribed. Uh, again, most drugs can be used beneficially uh, just in smaller doses. And, uh, you know, like, you can gain stuff out of it. Uh, like, uh, again, there's drugs that just hardly are, are beneficial. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, cocaine can be fun. But there's not many medicinal uses for cocaine anymore, especially, like, unless it was pure. And nothing is pure on the street. Like, there's so much chemicals and bullshit in it. Like, like the, c the thing that they're cutting cocaine with right now is a uh, horse dewormer, Right? So, like, there's horse dewormer, xylitol, um, God, fucking, I mean, it used to be baby laxative, uh, again, the safest one that they cut it with is, uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is just baking soda, which I don't know, under, understand why people don't, it's just, when you cut it so many times, the average, like, ball of cocaine, whatever, is only, like, literally, the strongest one you'll see on the street is usually about 20%, most of them are 10 and 8%, so that's like if you bought something around here, if you d ever did it, that's you'd only be getting like 8% to 15% cocaine that if you ever, if we ever saw on the street like 60%, you'd think it was like from God's ass, you know, and that's the thing is like, don't do stuff like that because my God, you're fucking putting shit up your nose in your brain that should never be in a human body at all. Like, if you're going to get it, you better know somebody that's, like, it's pure. And so, like, that kind of shit. Eh. And then you got, like, what the fucking the pharmaceutical amphetamines, which, you know, they work initially, but they cause so much deficits in the brain. Like, it's nothing's good for, like, all of the stuff that's made by pharmaceutical companies does not have you in mind. So, like, most of them don't have extreme diminishing returns. They're extremely addictive, addictive and fucking damage the shit out of your brain. Most of the stuff that they say is the worst is usually the best. Like, you know, I definitely, uh, MDMA can be overused, mm -hmm. but it can also be very good for the brain in small bursts. Like, you do some and you have an experience. It actually opens up a lot of empathy inside of a person, people that have depression. It helps that out. You can even use it for, like, therapy. Um, same thing with psychedelics. Uh, psychedelics are much more, like, rep like reparative to the brain. Um, it actually, like, they said that um, they showed, uh, they did a test to where they showed uh, people that were trying to use complex problems and things like that, and they used compartmentalized parts of their brain for each different task that they did. Some were emotional, some, and th that always, like, we always thought that they were in certain spots. It differs for every person. Every person's wired a little bit differently. So someone's emotional center that may fire over here may fire over here, you know. Uh, like we used to think of this cohesive, it's always the same. It's not. But it was always like, ba ba bop, ba ba bop, ba ba bop, depending upon what they were doing. They gave them a dose of LSD. All of them lit up and they communicated with each other. 
and now this is all the different parts of the brain. All different parts of the brain. Now they said that this and this never communicated with itself through any part, but LSD bridged the gap and made those things communicate with each other that never communicate. Which then, if like people had depression, permanently or short term, short term. But what ended up happening is that let's say that people that had traumas or PTSD or something like that, that they were compartmentalizing it, they were able to like cross over their reasoning and able to work through it. And so it never became a problem. Anyway. That's why it works so well. And then like maybe people that had things that they were storing or had problems. And some people like there was this one guy who fucking <laughs> fucking had a lisp. And that that's like fucking your brain's wired wrong. He had a lisp. He did enough LSD and his lisp went away. That he fixed his speech problem. And see, it's because of that that they actually observe scientifically that it, it helps uh, parts that normally don't communicate with each other communicate with each other. Mm. And sometimes you have very advanced parts of your brain that can almost correct anything, but they're not allowed to roam free and correct other stuff that then are le- like opened up. You break down those walls and like the hyper the hyper computative uh, higher wisdom part of your brain can actually like fix things. And um, that's why, I mean, me personally, I mean, I enjoy, I've enjoyed a psychedelic here and there in my life quite a few. Um, But I also, besides just trying to enjoy the experience and experience, I, if there's something that I think is wrong with me or something that I'm not getting over, I try to visit that during my trip because mm. in that state, I know that my brain is its, uh, uh, with some of its highest functionality, even if it seems distorted. So, like, I've actually tried to fix a but couple... But you can make sense of it whenever you're in a sober state of consciousness Yeah, yeah, bring it well. back, bring it back. I always used to talk about that. I'm just like, once you're in that state and you feel that, remember, stop, calm yourself, remember what that feels like. Hold that in, like, like stamp it in, in your being. I feel this. I, now I can bring this back. Let me bring this back. And then try to bring it back. And I think that that's the essential thing that you learn from psychedelics is because those states all exist. And you could constantly be in that state if you were able to hold that and able to create that yourself. But it's just bringing it back, remembering what that feels like. Because we can't do anything if we're really like shooting in the dark. But if you can feel that and understand it, you know it. And like just remember. you know. And that's what I think all knowledge is, is we're just remembering what we already know. Because if you've ever been, like I said, in those states... You know everything. You've known everything. And like physics shows that all time has already happened. And you exist in all those time frames and all those possibilities. Time seems to dissipate as well. That's the yeah. weirdest part oh, about yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fizzle out. Yeah. Um, like it just kind of fades away. I like that. Fizzle out. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is like if you looked at time as like um, almost a geometry as well. Um, that's why I really think geometry really plays into everything. Because, like, sound, light, geometry, everything creates what we see as this reality. And they all relate to one another. So space is more so of an illusion because it's just one big thing. But we have to have that illusion to learn. Because it's just, like, this larger creation learning from stuff. We're all parts of it. And it's, like, just flowering into infinity. And with each pulsation that this is time and we're moving through it. We're the, like, little cellular movement through it. And with each level of consciousness that we achieve is beyond that. We experience another another level of the whole until we eventually become one with what our true self is, which we are the true creator. We are that true thing that is evolving. And we're just all different parts, but we are fortunate enough to experience everything from the micro to the macro of it. And that that is existence. Is existence is experiencing other self and self as an expression of itself, you know? Um, but like the time is already all out there. It's all possibility and probability into infinity, which constantly changes, but it's always there, right? So it's constantly changing, but always is right with anything that you can think. And that's really interesting. That theory that uh, like, if it's, if it can be thought, it exists. So that's why your thoughts are so important because maybe with each thought you're creating a universe, you know, because you just created that potential within your mind that's maybe different than what anybody else thought. So thinking more positive thoughts creates more positive things. Thinking more negative things creates more negative things, even in your own personal life, because you're a personal creator. If you're constantly negative, you're always going to have things in your life that make you feel more negativity. If you're more positive, you're always going to draw things to yourself to 
creates more positivity. You're going to naturally take more positive action based upon your positive thoughts. Because like David was saying, like on his podcast about, like you both were talking about the law of attraction. Now, um, I would say more so like he was talking about the secret, which was more so the popularized thing. And I do believe that there were very much holes in it, like you guys were talking about. That, you know, people just think that they consider, I'm thinking positive thoughts. The universe is going to drop it in my lap. It doesn't work that way. You have to take action. You have to create. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And it's, it's, it's two-sided. But uh, there is a magnetism to it, like I say. Like, okay, if you think about if this is a hologram, here, I'll get back on this time. You see how he jump off things? I'm like, I'm going to describe this. And I go, on, <laughs> on, on. okay, well, we'll put a, put a pin in that, describe time. And like we see this through physics, and like quantum physics, theoretical physics, mathematics especially, which is a universal language, proves that this should be possible and should be that way. Is that, okay, let's say this is me, right? And I'm here, this is this. You're a geometry, right? That... This phone in my geometric space is closer to my wallet than your phone is, right? So these are potentials. So in my current experiential sphere, that it's more likely that I'm going to continue to talk to you on this, even though I have infinite possibility and probability. What's more or less likely in my geometric space? Did I fucking flip out and knock that glass off of there? That's very much less likely, depending upon that. But that's a geometric expression of probability and possibility. I'm more likely to do what's closer to me in my geometric uh, expression of sphere. Because I could do, and there's many realities that exist parallel to this, that I've done many other different things. There's probably a reality that I'm a serial killer. There's probably a reality that I'm, I'm just very not talkative. There's probably a reality I walked in here on a whole bunch of drugs. You know, there's probably a reality that I died from cancer. That all of those things are expressed and exist. It's just that through my consciousness, I choose the tributary that I take. And that's the empowering thought of it. Mm -hmm. That's always been my interpretation of the multiverse theory as yep. well. And here's the thing is that in my meditations, and this is something that I importantly, like, I would love to tell everybody this is because it helps. Even in, a, you know, you hold positive thoughts and you do positive things is that even despite, you know, my, because I like I, I have a lot of metabolic problems from all this, from all this, can like the cancer and all the things that happened to me. And uh, I've had pre genetic dispositions. So I'm constantly in a state of having to repair. So I have to like work 10 times harder just to exist normally than the normal average person. I don't mean to say that in that way because I'm not doing it in any in, like I'm better than or anything. I'm just saying that I have to do a lot of shit just to feel normal. Factually speaking. Yeah, yeah factually speaking. And don't get me wrong. I've learned so much from it and I can offer so much to other individuals on what health is and what maintaining a human body is. But it seems that even, and this is so funny because like, you know, I, I to told you I kind of believe in astrology, but in a different way is that when my whole fucking charts read, all of this shit's in there. I have something called a wounded healer. And it says that throughout my life that I always always will probably or have the influence. I'm not always because, like I said, none of it's concrete. It's always just an influence. That I will always have the influence of being thrown back on myself and always be trying to, like, um, like exactly what it implies, a wounded healer, someone who could help other people, but that, that it's happening to them what they're very much trying to heal others from. And it's been fucking the story of my fucking life. And it really is sometimes hard to be like, because I want to be like, I need to get over this. I need to have the answer for everybody else before I tell anybody about it. I don't want to tell anybody the wrong thing. I don't want to do it because, you know, all these people say, this is the way, this is the way. And, oh, no, it's not. Oh, this is the way, like you said. And I don't want to do that to anybody, you know? And I hold myself back from helping people because I always want to have the right way. I always want to have something tangible that I can give to people to help them be more of themselves, to reach their full potential, because that's all I ever want for anybody. That's all I ever want for myself. I want us all to reach our full potential, which is infinite. And that we have been so taken away from that empowerment. And our that potential I, as individuals or our potential as a species or both? All, all. It's just that like if we reach the full potential as individuals, we would reach the full potential as our species because we would realize that we're more also one than what we think. And like that's it is like we've been so taken away from our potential and so de made so dependent upon something else that we don't know how to be the full creators that we are. We don't know how to be the full gods that we are. 
And I use that as more of a loose term because, you know, people get the ego about, I'm a God. Mm. But, I mean, we are. We are. We're creators. We're creators of our own existence. We're part of something larger that we eventually will become. Beautiful thought. And that that that's it is that that's why i really like again that's why i kind of had resistance at first when i first like this is because like i wanted to come on this uh, this podcast but like i always tend to have something i just was feeling so healthy and everything like that and then i got myself like a urinary tract infection that then turned into a kidney infection just because of the some way i was going about something and i really do again i got got kind of an ego about like being in kind of like a self healer of myself i don't like fuck the medical society i can do it myself <laughs> but i mean I, I usually can and i want people to get back to that and that's the thing is like there's a balance that the ego's like yeah i've done this many times i can do it again but also i just want people to know that you don't have to run to the doctor that what do people do before there were doctors they healed themselves they figured things out. They understood their body and its language. And we need to get back to that because now people run to the doctors and then they fucking kill them. The people could have saved themselves and they die. People could have not been sick. People could have, I mean, it's necessary. Like if you get shot, you need to go in and have surgery, shit. Like don't try to pick that bullet out yourself unless you're some sort of gangster or thug and you can't go there. You know, whatever. But... I mean, wouldn't it be nice to know how to sew yourself up? That's basic. Wouldn't it be nice to know how to inject yourself with something if you need it? That's basic. But you don't. We have to run to a nurse and pay $1,000 for them to stick a needle in our arm. Mm. You know? How about an IV? IV's super necessary. Not many people know how to do that. You have to run to an emergency room. I certainly don't. Yeah. Those are common things that you think you should be able to know. And the people did, you know, and uh, just like if I do, I does the common person that uh, the common millennial that looks at their phone all day, do they know how to fix an upset stomach besides Googling it? You know, and you're going to get a whole bunch of pharmaceuticals and things that you have to go buy. Does anybody know how to just go out into the woods and pick up something and be like, I can mix a serve in a tea and make my stomach better? Or even just find it yeah, on Amazon. Yeah, find it on Amazon. Not many people know how to do that. Just and for the sake of avoiding a very, very expense. Yeah. Very expensive expense. And, like, again, you find that, uh, like, herbs are way stronger than pharmaceuticals. And if you know the right ones, I was shocked. It blew my mind. Like, I was a big coffee drinker. I'm Okay, my addiction, still to this day, I use it more for a medicinal quality, and I regulate myself on it. But I'm not going to lie. I love caffeine. And caffeine even though I really like try to keep it below the normal recommendation and I really monitor myself on it because I know that I used to drink like three to 400 milligrams a day and uh, like sometimes five. Um, now I drink anywhere from, I try to keep it under 150, 200. If it's a, like a, like if I'm doing something specific that whatever I'm taking has a lot of caffeine in it because a lot of like a lot of teas and stuff do um, below 300. Right. And so like, my thing was, is like they had all these herbal teas. And I'm like, why well, drink herbal tea if it doesn't have caffeine in it just for the taste? I'm thinking for the taste or for this or for that. And I found that a lot of these herbal teas that they don't really advertise because they can't. And I understand why. It's because if they claim to do anything that the FDA scrutinizes them and it has to be licensed by either a pharmaceutical company or this or that or the other thing or they can be sued. Even though... They in other like uh, countries that they may use it in their Chinese herbal system or like Ayurvedic stuff, but they can't in America claim that it does anything because they have to watch what they claim because the FDA cracks down on that. And so there's a lot of these herbal teas. Like for instance, uh, go to cola. I drink that on a daily basis. They can't market the natural benefits of the no. herbal teas. Most Why? of them they can because they can't claim that it cures or treats any disease, even if it does, unless it was approved by the FDA, which a common FDA, uh, like even Passover kind of thing that you have to jump through a whole bunch of loopholes for is to cost $30,000. And then it has to be patented on top of that. Most of the licenses cost over $100,000 that you have to have to sell a supplement and claim that it does anything, which then has to be tested by them and what they deem is okay and all the different boards to do that, which then pharmaceutical companies have a hand in, which the thing is, is like 
okay, the reason that herbs are so mm, by the pharmaceutical companies is they cannot patent an herb. They can only patent an extract or a constituent of an herb. So they have to make either a synthetic something or an extract from to be able to patent it. So, like, they find herbs useless because they can't market them, right? They can't change them or do anything to them, and they can't own the rights. But they can own the rights to extracts. They can own the rights to chemical structures. So no one else can make them or they have to pay them a fee to make them. Um, and so, like, you have all of these herbs that do amazing things, but the pharmaceutical companies are going to, because they're multi-trillion, billion-dollar companies, they're going to put out, they're going to pay a whole bunch of people to smear these herbs or to really repress them because it's chum change to them to do so, right? And it's in their interest to make more money. So do you think the FDA is kind of bought out? Oh, 100%. By the, by the yeah. pharmaceutical yeah. companies? I did this because, like, in my cancer research and things like that, I had to look into a lot of things that would be considered fringe. And I found a lot of things that actually cured skin cancer that the FDA says is complete poison for you. That the, uh, after a while, because I kept on looking into things and looking into things, then trying them out. Because fuck it. Don't be scared. That's the thing is you're never going to know unless you try it. If you fuck up, well, it didn't work. As long as it's not going to kill you, just people are too scared. And like you be your own guinea pig. That's the only way you're going to find out shit is by trying it out. I've done so many drugs that should have killed people. Trust me, I wasn't afraid to try something that was kind of a little fringe. It's because it's not going to fuck me up more than those drugs did. And so I did, and man, um, like pretty much I found that like, and this is like 90% true, I'd say at least 90% true, right? Is that if the FDA says it's wrong and it's bad and they spend money to lobby against it. It's probably a reason. Yeah, it works. Because they do not spend money on shit. If they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to say something is bad for you, they don't give a fuck if you die. They don't give a fuck about you. It's all about money. So if they say it's bad and they take concerted efforts to put people in jail and to like spend money on it, that means it works. And you know what? If you follow that, you don't need to wade through anything. Just by following that, you can find some of the best medications, best things on earth that really help you. Like DMSO being one of them. DMSO is uh, dimethyl sulfoxide, and anybody who has skin cancer, I would recommend using it. It's a solvent, right? And you know what a solvent is? What about as a preventative measure? A uh, preventative measure, well, there's a lot of things for it. Like, I'll go kind of through this. Th that's good, too. A uh, dimethyl sulfoxide is going to be like, um, you know, plant sulfur, right? Okay. Plant, plant sulfur is like MSM, right? Um, and that's something that's needed for the joints and just for like a different metabolic processes in the body. It actually is an anti-cancer agent as well. And so dimethyl sulfoxide, it has that molecule in it, right? But it's the strongest solvent on earth. So that means anything that you put in it, it soaks up. But the reason what makes this so special is because water is a solvent. There's a lot of things that are solvent. Is that this comes from trees, is that it's the constituents that move through the cells in trees. So we make this in wood, uh, wood processing plants that we extract this from the trees, but it has to be so strong that it moves through wood molecules. So when you put it on your skin, it immediately moves through all your cells and enters into your cells, which is hard to do for anything else. So that's the secret, is whatever you put in that motherfucking shit, it will go through all of your cells. Like, if you took... Uh, something and put it into a syringe and shot it into yourself, you could do the same thing with DMSO. You put the shit on that. Just rubbing, topically. Topically. And so that's why it was such a good cancer-fighting agent is because l the problem is, is with skin cancer, it's really hard to get into those tumor cells because they're protected, right? I mean, there are a lot of ways that you could inject into that, which the medical society doesn't want to cure it. They don't do injections that often, but you could carry something, whatever you want, into the cell. And so a lot of people were using oxidizing agents because oxygen is the enemy of cancer cells because they're anaerobic, which means no oxygen. And the natural human cell takes in oxygen. That's the difference between the two. One does not want oxygen. The other one does. And so by getting oxygen into it, it destroys them. So people were taking um, something called, uh, what was that shit called? It's MMS which is, uh, again, another one that's smeared, and they try to push it as a being bleach, but it's a constituent called sodium, um, sodium chloride that is in bleach 
that when you mix it with citric acid and you have to know like chemistry on this, what it does is it flips the molecule into something else to where it's an oxidized version of it that is not super toxic for the body, that human cells actually have resistance for it. Uh, but like people that don't know, they're like, that's bleach, people put bleach in their body, oh, you know, whatever. But th you get that into the cancer cell and it fucking destroys it. Now that does not work for certain cancers, but that works for skin cancer amazingly. And you know what? I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not anybody like this. this is a subjective experience for entertainment only. Like they could come after me for just claiming that if they really wanted to, if they thought I was important enough just for saying that I could be sued out my ass, you know, and that's what's fucked up. Just for saying something works. Yeah. Yeah. But just, 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 I'm not valuable enough. I don't sell any products. I'm not anything like that to uh -huh. be a target. So I can just voice that as... What if you weren't getting any economic incentive to do so? You were just stating well, if general my, information. If, if my voice was loud enough, they'd come after me, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's the thing is they come after people for that kind of shit. It's because that's the biggest like money-making industry. There was a doctor that said like, oh man, and this was a, just a really, popular, a really popular good doctor that said that, why do you think we still use chemotherapy? He said, do you think we use it because it works? He said that most doctors get anywhere from a five thousand to an eight thousand dollar kickback for every um, thing of chemotherapy that they sell, and it's one of the most expensive things that they sell. So, not only that, but he said, "Well, why would we keep something that had a ninety-two percent failure rate?" Oh my goodness! He said that okay, if Ford with terrible side effects, yeah, with terrible side effects, most people die from the actual chemo and being weakened from it rather than the cancer. That's the thing is you get so weakened that then the cancer takes over. So more people die from the chemotherapy itself than, than the actual cancer. And Seeing that's chemo suffering is almost as sad as yeah. witnessing something like the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. That is unreal, man. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is just you just think about it. Like if that's the it's general knowledge that we all should have. It's just like radiation tears apart DNA for every fucking because cancer cells protect themselves, okay? They want to survive just like anything else. And they're the minority in your body, right? Your body naturally has cancer cells. That's the thing that people need to understand. If you're not cancer free all the time, you always have cancer cells. Just something happens in your body that it can't regulate that amount and they start to grow and then they and this is really interesting is that cancer cells actually use antioxidants which everybody preaches, you know, antioxidants help you, right? They surround themselves with antioxidants. Why? Is they want to protect themselves. So they protect themselves with this antioxidant wall so nothing can fucking get in there because they don't want anything to do that, right? And they're intelligent. And they move in an intelligent way. They really coherently structure each other. They make that like tumor, and then the tumor has all these walls and protective mechanisms that nothing can get in, you know? And then they even trick your white blood cells into thinking that it's not a threat sometimes and there's all sorts of different things that the cancer cells do to survive now the thing is is that you have to be aware of that cellular process that it wants to survive and by using mechanisms like getting inside the cell that's important duh get inside the cell to destroy it from the inside because that's where you need to be oxidize the cell okay what what now the medical field does not look at this at all with most tumors, and in inside of the cell, we have a, like a pH. Everything has a different pH in our body, right? And that, like, most cells are more on the alkaline side, healthy cells. Just so happens, cancer cells are super acidic. They require acidity. So inside of that cell, it's super acidic, and they can't move or expand into an alkaline environment. So what do they do? They surround themselves with like an acid pool and they move that acid out so then they can expand. And then they move that acid out so they can expand by cellular death. So they kill the cells around it and then they die and they ferment and they make acid and then they move and then move and then move. What a parasite. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, exactly, right? So that is not looked at by medical society. If you say, hey, well, I need to alkalize my cells, they're like, no, that's not medically proven. So they don't take that approach. Just like it is, it has been medically proven by a million doctors. So if but you were doing something as simple as drinking alkaline water, would that, that be effective? That, or well, okay, now, or here's the thing. Or is that more preventative? 
Now, oh, now this is going to really like, and this I don't mean to be this way because I know you say that uh, you have the like kind of the conspiracy theory mind and you know like or paranoid mind, um, but this is real. Is that you look okay? Um, pharmaceutical companies, people who run them, most likely sociopaths, most likely very intelligent people. So if you had the pharmaceutical industry and people know through psychology that people are going to buck against that. There's going to be the anomalies that do not follow the normal whatever. So you polarize them, right? Okay, then you say nutrition is the answer, right? And everybody thinks that this is so opposing from pharmaceutical companies. Did you know 80% to 90% of all uh, actual vitamin companies are owned by pharmaceutical companies? Oh my God. So most of that shit is owned by pharmaceutical companies, so they get you the other way. They actually control most of it. There are ones that aren't, but it's such a small percentage. So they literally own the whole thing, and everybody thinks that they're so, oh, I don't follow this, I go over there. You're fucking, you're buying from the same pharmaceutical company that sells Pfizer. You know, what the fuck? And so that's really important to understand. They're just like, I wouldn't say shell companies because it's not that in-depth, but they have, you know, like subsidiaries and sister companies and things, so they don't use the actual name. Kind of like Monsanto, right? You know, you, and everybody kind of knows that name now. Um, that it's a very, very bad and evil company that does a lot of the GMOs. And uh, they used to be the ones that made Agent Orange. They were a poison company. Is that right? Yeah. They were the original ones that made Agent Orange. They specialized in poisons, and then they started making our food. Oh my they God. never, before that point, they never did any genetic modification. They're just like, we are the masters of poison. Let's start making food. That was smart. And so then they did that, but they got sued by so many people that the, like, they're like, we're going to need to do something. So guess who bought them out? Bayer. You know, people who make aspirin? Mm -hmm. They bought them out. They are Monsanto now. They continue. They've absorbed the company, and they continue to genetically modify food. Even though everybody's like, yeah, we beat Monsanto. No, you didn't. It's Bayer now. It's even bigger. Yeah, and so that's what I'm saying, is that li lots of people, by the illusion of not knowing that everything that any system that exists is a controlled system. And I'm sorry to say that. It's just we have to find the outliers. But don't ever expect there to be something mainstream that has a lot of money behind it that has good intentions. Because it doesn't exist. Power attracts negativity. And I mean, it attracts positivity too. But in our system that we have designed, in a pure, like, pure, pure idol system or whatever the fuck, is you're always going to have those sociopaths that rise to the top and they're always going to control it because you know what? If you're a good one and you're at the top, you will be eliminated. And that's unfortunate, you know? I mean, we may have paradigm shifts, but we will have to bring down the system and the way that it's structured for it to ever be better because it will always attract. It's designed to attract that. It's designed that way. It's designed to not promote cooperation. It's designed that I'm better than you. It's designed to always have someone on the top and always have someone on the bottom. And the bottom perpetuates the top. The bottom holds up the top. Without the foundation, the whole thing crumbles. And that's what a lot of people don't realize. If we all said, fuck this, it would crumble the whole fucking system. Absolutely. And be like even banking is that like there's something called fractional reserve lending. You can like for every dollar, that, well, for every $10 that they, t well, excuse me, for every dollar that they take in, they can loan out nine. So even though they don't have the money to ba back what they lend, they can do ten times more than what, than what they take in. So like if everybody was like, <laughs> just like one, if one state, just everybody in it was like, I want to pull out my money, they wouldn't have it. They wouldn't have it on hand. It would literally collapse that whole system. It's because most money that's floating around is imaginary. It's just some numbers on a thing. The money that they lend out to people that they get interest back on doesn't exist. That happens on a small level and a large level. And like I said, if we all just decided to just take our money out, we would fucking collapse the whole banking system. And you know what? The whole banking system... Is that a good thing? Well, here's the thing. Is that because of this whole system, that's why we all have to work and that's why there's wages and that's why there's everything that there is. It drives the whole slavery system. That's the backbone of debt. That's the backbone of our government's debt. Those are the ones that have the arms up the ass of Uncle Sam. Like nothing is done just for the fact that they're just like, oh no, we need to pay it back. And it's all an illusion. It doesn't, it's worthless. It's just a power. 
it's a power thing to make sure that they can control. And I forget who that was that one of those, uh, one of those like either Rockefellers or uh, Rothschilds that said, he's like, you can make all the laws. I don't care. But I'll, I want to control the money because the money makes the laws. You know, oh. he said, you can write the, all the laws you want. I'll take the money, you know, and because like that's what matters. The n- none of the none of the government systems and everything they all follow that, and they're all in debt, you know. Um, so that's it. Is like those Forbes lists are bullshit. They aren't the ones that hold the most money. Truthfully, the Queen of England holds some of the most money. Um, she actually they they said that like the estimated amount that she has, which it's actually illegal to even look at her ledger. Um, same thing with the Pope. You're not allowed to ever see his ledger in any form or fashion. He is above every government and everything like that. They could murder millions of people. They have sovereignty to every law, by the way. And the Pope, the Pope, and the um, uh, and the Queen of England, because they were joking around about that in the UK. Because everybody glorifies the Queen over there. They're raised in such a way to look at her as like a god. You curse the Queen. Oh my God. You curse our president. We're like, oh yeah, I understand why you hate him. Or I understand this or that, or maybe I don't feel that way. Uh-huh. Whatever. That's how we feel about it. You curse the queen, that's a blasphemy. That's how different our cultures are. But then we look at the Queen of England, we look at all the stuff over there, and we're like, wow, they're horrible they're horrible people. You know, they just put on that face. But again, it's like the Stockholm syndrome. They they're like, Oh yeah, that's so great. She has enough money to feed every person on earth over three hundred thousand meals. What? She has enough money to fucking buy every bit of land and then have trillions of dollars more. So, like, she could help anybody, but she just continues to accumulate money and do nothing with it. Doesn't give a fuck about her whole nation. She could make her whole nation amazing, could fix all everything with the money that she has. Does she do that? No, but she creates the divide. You know, and I'm not saying that she, it's not just she, but it's the whole family. It's the whole family bloodline. It's what they've done. You know, that's the whole thing is like, oh, there's this whole, like, fucking, oh, man. Is it like, uh, going back to, like, the path that I took, because this will lead into it, is that, like, my stomach wasn't, back to the cancer thing, my stomach wasn't fixed. I had this dream, because, like, for a while I was doing vegetarianism, and I was kind of following Vegetable Police and his little journey with his, uh, He's doing veganism and things. I'm trying a lot of stuff that he's trying. It's kind of helping me out, kind of fucking me up here and there. Um, and then all of a sudden, that's when he kind of, sw- like, I had this dream that I had all this, uh, m- my friends around me, and they were all eating, like, beans and vegetables and everything like that. But then they gave me a plate, and they gave me a plate of just bacon. And I'm like, but no, I, I don't want to eat this. And they're like, this is what you need to eat. And I'm like, okay, okay. And I just remember waking up from that dream and thinking, shit, I'm going to need to eat meat. And then all of a sudden, like a couple days later, vegetable police comes out and he's like, you know, I was doing these, all these things and it's fucking me up. And then there's all these people online that are doing strict carnivore diets and fixing their stomach because that was his primary problem. And so he tried it for... Oh, you know, so you guys had the same yeah, goal. Same, same goal. Yeah, tried to he did it for like a month and didn't tell anybody because he wanted to because he's a vegan forever so how long and preached it and everything and, and he's like i just wanted to prove it wrong i just wanted to try it and prove it wrong and be like oh yeah i tried to fuck this and he said that then he, his stomach started to heal and then he got better and he had energy and things and so like he waited a month and he's like well i've been doing this for a while and it's really you know da 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 i'm like wow even he moved over to it and this i had the dream like a week before i even knew this and so i'm like i'm gonna try this and so I, did, I didn't want to stop the keto because it had too many benefits from it. And so I did a carnivore keto, nothing but meat. And then I experienced a lot of healing in my stomach. It took away a lot of my inflammatory response. I actually wow. healed a lot of my reactive properties because uh-huh. I was just doing too many. Ve- like I couldn't catch up from the damage that I did from going all vegan for a while. Just my body started to react to it. It's just too much. And it was just like, ah, ah, vegetables. Ah, ah, ah." You know, because I did it, you know, and I can eat them now. And I can, like, I'm way past that. But, like, I did that. And, like, I would say the carnivore diet's the easiest way 
to fix your stomach. Because we still have leftover traits. Fixing in stomach implying like stomach ulcers? Uh, no, I, w- I would say there's more to it than that. But like it, what it digestion. does. Digestion. Digestion, um, inflammatory response, and allergic reaction. It will stop all of that. And it will really take your inflammation down. Any kind of rebuilding that needs to happen, you get the collagen from it, which rebuilds your stomach and things like that. There's a lot of things that like have a high vitamin D3. For instance, like, okay, you think about um, readily available vitamins, right? Most vitamins, when you get them through certain things, your body has to convert it, convert it, convert it before it absorbs it, right? Just so happens in most meats that the conversions have already happened. The animal ingested things, which then converted it and then stored in the meat. So if your body's having problems absorbing, you eat that meat, and again, good sourced meat, not this fucking factory farm bullshit. Factory farm bullshit is just like void of everything and has a whole bunch of antibiotics and bullshit in it that poisons you anyway. But if you get good grass-fed, let, we'll just use beef for an example. You get grass-fed beef that's fully grass-fed throughout its whole life, and then, you know, you mainly treated, which that actually affects the meat quality, you're good. You will get all of these vitamins. Wait, treating it, what do you mean by that? Okay, well, all right. Well, again, let's put a pin in this because I want to get back to this. Very important is uh, the bioavailability. Well, let's let's finish that first. Uh, the bioavailability of those vitamins is that they're already converted, and so your body readily availably uses them. In most meats, it already has all the enzymes that are produced in your stomach that naturally break down the meat itself. That's why when you leave meat outside, it sort of rots, you know? Well, those are those enzymes breaking it down, right? The enzymes that break down flesh are the same that we use to digest. The, uh, the ones that break down plants are different than us. They're very genetically far from us. But the like meat, of course, we're meat. It's genetically closer to us. So it recognizes all of those things. It's more readily available. Like I said, that our, our digestive systems are more close to a wolf, which a wolf eats raw meat. Mm-hmm. And so to, it, when you want to heal yourself, because we are different than wolves. We are different and we have evolved. And at one time, I do believe that certain species of human beings were more fruit eaters and maybe more balanced. But we went through all these ice ages to where like there was no vegetation and we had to survive and evolve. And that's when our digestive system shortened and things like that. So we had to eat primarily meat. And the, the last one, and I, this is what I believe, this is all me here because I haven't really heard anybody else preach this, but follow me here, is that we have an ice age and then, you know, age of flourishing, ice age, you know, it goes like that. And it's just fucking perfectly like clockwork. But the last one was different. We had a big ice age and we were coming out of it. And then all of a sudden we were knocked back into a mini ice age, right? And all science just fucking ignores this. I'm just like, something happened. Something knocked us back. And we see this. And a lot of the people that I look into that actually look into the evidence see that. And we've proved it now that there was some sort of comet that hit the, uh, hit the, one of the ice shelves. The ice shelves collapsed, made a whole bunch of water vapor come up, blacked out the earth for a long time, which caused it to rapidly freeze. That's why we find all these fossils of like holy uh, woolly mammoths with grass in their mouths that were frozen solid because it happened like that. And so like the natural like in and out that we had that we could have maybe survived by eating plants and eating this and that, like we probably went to a thing we had to eat more meat and instead of coming out of it, then we were thrown back into it. We still had to eat meat. So we had like twice as long eating just animal products. So we had to survive. So everybody was in more so ketosis all the time. Everybody had to eat a lot of fat just to survive. And everybody had to eat high amounts of protein, which we see. And in that time frame, our brains tripled in their size. Because guess what happens when you eat a lot of fat? Because your brain is primarily feeds on that 10 times more efficiently. Your brain grows. And so, like, I mean, there's also, like, super evidence of genetic modification. But that's a whole other conversation. Because, like, they even said that there's no possible way that we could have, like, grown and evolved over time because we see how, like, things evolve over time that much in that short amount of time. It's just almost impossible. There's no fucking explanation for it that there had to be some sort of intervention, which I do believe that there was. But, uh, that, like I said, a whole other conversation. Does this kind of tie in back to the doubling of the human mass, like, the, the mass of the human brain? Yeah. Doubling um, within what two million it, years? Yeah, like it's that? yeah, it's just like it's ridiculous on how much it did because it didn't in any other time frame, and uh, again the 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 like Neanderthals, mm-hmm. right? Now there's a weird weird thing that happens there. Nobody really talks about. It's usually there's like this gradual in the evolutionary theory. Everything's gradual. There's missing links and there's things and up and down. 
but okay, you have you have Neanderthals. And then all of a sudden, oh, out of nowhere, Homo sapien, right? And Homo sapien was smaller, smaller than these guys. These guys actually had humongous skulls. So even their brains were kind of a little bit bigger. Because we're only saying that what, how we grew, not how they did, because they died off quickly. Or were they killed off? Yeah, exactly. Now here's the thing, is you have this smaller thing that just appears, boop, out of nowhere. No evolutionary fucking lead up to it all. Because, you know, these that things don't humans? evolve. And yeah, like, yeah, the Homo sapien is because, like, the next best thing like there had to be such an amazing leap from that and I forget what one the Homo erectus or something like it's such a ridiculous leap it was different and it was just one and then it just like they fucking exploded like they were almost placed there and then the Neanderthals that were living like just for a short time with them they all just disappeared within several generations so a whole race of people that lasted for fucking thousands of years just disappeared within a couple generations, and then the Homo sapien was dominant, which was the smaller one. Smaller, less muscle, does not make sense. And they're like, Neanderthal, because they say Neanderthals, dumb, duh, 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 that's why. They, they outsmarted them. Their brains were fucking triple the size by their skull mass than the Homo sapien. What happened? It seems like something happened there. Like, that's one thing that uh, I never really got when I looked at mainstream science and then I look at, like, actual, like, you know, in, into it deeper, that something happened there. That wasn't a natural thing. That it seems like there was some sort of modification that everything was smaller. It seemed like, again, supporting more of a slave race kind of thing that that kind of happened and there was a whole race that was eliminated by something. By you know, what's the question? Okay. What is the question? So maybe there was environmental changes that led to Homo sapiens being dominant. But why would the Homo? Why would the smaller brained, smaller physical stature ones survive quickly, and a whole race be wiped out? It almost seems as if we we killed them off, or yeah. if we. I mean, we could say that the Homo sapiens were more violent. That's that's yeah. definitely a hypothesis. Um, but uh, just uh, and maybe the, I, I don't know. Maybe altering environmental changes that led to us being able to take on that environment more sustainably in comparison to Homo or Homo uh, Neanderthals. You know, there's there's a lot of theories. I just find that interesting, and I have like a couple. Again, I mine's more esoteric, so mine couldn't be physically tangibly proven uh -huh. uh, mine's more so through like a whole lot of channelings and uh, a lot of hypnosis and things like that and looking into reincarnation and they all kind of say the same thing from different sources that's how i really find a lot of stuff is like a whole bunch of different sources that haven't been exposed to each other at any point in time or were in different points in history they all say the same thing and uh are from vastly different sources uh that's where you usually like ooh, you know something's something's with that uh -huh. um but uh yeah getting back to the carnivore thing right Okay, so, like, saying that that's probably what we did, that's probably how we evolved. Now, um, a lot of cultures back then uh, would eat, uh, raw meat was a normal thing. Like, we've really pushed away from that, but raw meat was what a lot of cultures ate. It, they, I mean, before fire, what the fuck did human beings do? They ate fucking raw meat, right? We're, we're told that raw meat is bad, there's so much bacteria in it and everything like that, but now we're finding out that we're pretty much bacteria buses, that there's more bacteria cells in our body than human cells. And so that most of our immune system, which relies, remember I told you it was like, you know, the same as the brain. It was our first. Yeah, that's what we were talking about, the, like the second brain. Um, is that... That being dictated by the gut microbiome? Well, yeah, you have... Okay, you have your brain, which is more so of your computative, well, they say machine and things like that. And you have the blood-brain barrier that protects it because it does not really have the ability to fight any kind of bacterial load. Um... But you have the vagus nerve, which goes directly from the brain, directly to the heart, directly to the gut, and connects those three things. And it's the ma major nerve bundle that connects everything. And then there's all these tributaries that kind of are like sub-nerves to that major nerve system. Now, that the cells, it's identical cells that are in your brain or in your heart or in your gut. The same... That there's actually, you know, serotonin that's produced in your brain, which they say is the feel-good chemical, whatever, and makes you feel calmness and tranquility. There's more serotonin in your gut than any other part of your body. 
Is that right? Yeah. Really? The peripherally serotonin is used more here than it is here. And that, like a lot of the, like a lot of the serotonin is carried back and forth. Uh, it's just that it's really, really hard, again without nutrition, to get that shit past that blood-brain barrier. Now, like looking at that, is that they found that people who have more of a bacterial load of diversity in their gut are actually happier individuals and suffer from less depression. The people who are the most depressed have actually very poor gut biflora is that that's directly correlated to mood. And so, like, that now we've eaten so much cooked food and so much processed food that our bacterial loads are (laughs) really low, and we're told that, and we're all depressed. I mean, that's one of the many different things that are making us depressed. But let's start there. Now, here's where it really gets weird because you have to really reflip your thinking around to do this is that I started doing the carnivore diet. I felt a lot of thi- you know things from it. You know, the pharmaceutical industries are like red meat's the enemy, da 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 da, low fat, uh, don't do high fats, which I'm doing the complete opposite of that in healing. And like cholesterol is the enemy. Like, and then I f- look into cellular biology and see that that's all bullshit, right? Because they want you to be sick. So the only thing that makes truthfully cholesterol bad is you have um, good cholesterol and then you have LDL, which is bad cholesterol, right? Now, both of those, cle- because they polarized it, good and bad, there's no such thing as good and bad cholesterol. There is two different types of cholesterol. The only thing that makes this one bad, the LDL, is, is oxidation. So you can have the presence of both of them as long as that one's not oxidized, because if you oxidize that, it becomes plaque, which then builds up. What causes oxidation of LDL? Inflammation. Inflammation and sugar, that's what causes oxidation of it. So in the presence of high carbohydrates and refined sugar, which refined sugar all across the board causes inflammation, it oxidizes and becomes bad. So it's in a whole other culprit than the actual cholesterol itself. It's what you're putting in that's causing that cholesterol to turn bad. So if you, have, if you take refined sugar out, as long as you don't go just crazy on the carbohydrates you will never have cholesterol problems. Even if your cholesterol is just like, maybe if you, even if you're just like pumping fucking gallons of cholesterol in your body, it'll actually help you heal. Because that's what your bo- body, that's one of the major building blocks of your body is collagen and cholesterol. Because Where do you get collagen from? Um, collagen is usually from animal fats, animal sinews, um, like uh, bone broth. Uh, bone broth has some of the highest collagen content because it's uh, from... Um, Bone marrow. Where would you suggest getting bone broth from? Like, would it be just um, would it be good from just your local Walmart? Um, sometimes it just depends it upon. On okay, own? sourcing is uh, really a good thing. Okay, well here this is why sourcing is so important. It's not only because you know caring about animals and the way that they're treated, but okay if a if a cow is fed grain over grass, it doesn't produce half the vitamins. In its own self, so you're pretty much only paying for half of your yeah. wanting to get the nutrition. You won't value like. There's a specific specific en- enzymes and shit like that that will never be produced, and from that, they're naturally meant to eat grass. So it's really important to get a 100% grass-fed cow, which doesn't really cost that much more. Like you can go to well around here. Actually, we don't have as much access around here as we do in some other big cities. But now it's becoming trendy to be healthy, so therefore it gives us more access. That's the good side. That's the positive side of trend, is that, like, that's really important to know. If we keep more, as consumers, if we buy more healthy things, companies will see that and they will provide us with more health healthy things because it's supply and demand. If we stop buying all that bullshit, that we will get more healthy <laughs> things because a lot of people are like. It doesn't matter what I buy because it's, you know, the availability and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it does. You buy more shit. They want to sell you shit. They're going to sell you what you buy more of. So if you buy more healthy things, you actually create the paradigm of them selling you more healthy things. It's kind of, like, you know, like an Ouroboros. It eats itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, but like uh, one of them did, I'm trying, what is it? Which is one of the good things about like Whole Foods or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, we have Mama Jeans around here, and I buy this bone broth. I'm trying to remember what the fuck it is. It's, uh, I want to say it's like heritage or something like that. But, yeah, just l- the main thing to look for with bone broth is grass-fed. Grass-fed. Okay. Grass-fed bone broth is the main thing you want to do, and they try to trick people. Uh, 100% grass-fed is what you want. Somewhat grass-fed is fine, too. 
um, because what they do is they trick people. They say grass fed just to catch the trend. And what they do is because they don't say 100% and it's not verified is that they'll grass feed them and graze them up into the point of uh, like three months before uh, they slaughter them. And then they'll just put them in a stall and they'll feed them all grain to fatten them up. So all of the th good stuff that they initially did is wiped out by all the grain. That so they that's the incentive right there for farmers. Because I, I yeah. uh, grew up with my grandpa being mm -hmm. a farmer and mm -hmm. I remember the cows were always corn fed. Yeah. So the incentive for them to be grain fed or fatter, corn fed, fattier, fattier meats, uh, yeah, more things profits. Like, yeah, more profits. Okay. Per pound, and plus, again, it's cheaper. It's super cheap to buy corn. It's one of the cheapest things to buy. Easily accessible, grains easily accessible, cheap, and then like to actually put in the work to graze your cows all the time is a lot of work. What do you mean by graze them? I'm graze them because you have to pay attention to your grass. You have to literally be a not only a, a cow rancher, you have to be a grass grower because you have to have grass that's sustainable and you have to be like, okay, they feed on this lot while that lot grows and they feed on this lot while that lot grows. They feed on this lot. So there's an art to it and they just people don't want to have to take that time because they're pressured by all these companies to sell all this shit. And that's it because they're like, oh, we're going to go under if we don't yeah, get this profit. Incentives yeah, personal incentives to be yeah, able personal to make as much money much. as possible. And that's what I'm saying is like you even – You got to just make a living. And that's what they're doing is those companies are pressuring the small farmer to make that money because they'll barely be able to skim over and pay all the fees and pay all the shit. And then the FDA has to improve their meat. They have to do this. They have to pay the FDA to do this. They have to pay the FDA to the USDA to do that. And so they're just like – they almost make it to where you can't do anything naturally anymore because you'll just fucking, like, you know, be fucking stomped on. And that's what's happening. And uh, just recently, we've been lucky enough to have the supply and demand or the demand for healthier foods. But it's still struggling. Positive the, side of trends. Yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah, the wow. Positive side of trends, yeah. And do you think, do you think, how much do you think with uh, positive sides of trends with people just being more informed with the internet? Yes, that is the positive side of the internet is more information does breed action, and that's what the companies understand. Which is creating demand, which is mm -hmm. the positive side of capitalism as well. Exactly, because there's always a positive side to everything. There's always polarity, because we, we exist in a polarized system. Again, this hologram, this dream, this thought, whatever you want to call it, is duality. It's perfectly called that for a reason is because it tends to polarize things into right and wrong, black and white, night and day, everything like that, to learn. Because it was the original learning system. It's just that negative people, negative entities, if you will, utilize the natural integrated nature of the universe to manipulate us as well. Mm. So they're using something that's naturally there. It's a tool. Tools aren't polarized. Tools are universal. But they are used to polarize. See? And uh, that's because the system naturally does that. Okay. And like, I mean, once you move above the system, you'll realize that everything's a little bit more universal. That's that's one of the main things I've been trying to implement to my thinking in the past few months. I would say, uh, is to be able to see the duality as illusory. Yeah. As the polarity as illusory, because I think to some degree, most of it is. Most yeah. of it is, generally speaking. It, it is, it is. And like I, like I said, the, the, like we were talking about it, you see planets are polarized. Like even into, because polarity goes across the whole spectrum. It goes into magnetism, right, in and out. You go to male and female. Yin and yang. Yin and yang. You know, just our viewpoints, right and wrong, which are completely our own creation. Because they're really, when you look at the universe, do the planets think what was right and wrong does movement do the laws of the universe do animals think what's right and wrong they don't they just live so that's our own creation and that's what a lot of people just can't get past oh good and evil it's our own creation now there are things that are more beneficial and then there are things that are more destructive that is a truth like you know uh, if a planet decided not to be in its system and have its harmonial balance with everything else all the other planets would be like fucking pinball blah, 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 blah. you know so everything works in a harmony and that is what you would consider more good or evil. Or like, let's look at this on a larger sense of like human beings. There's service to self and there's service to others. And there's a balance between the both to create what existence is and understanding and relationship. Is that somebody who's more self-sufficient like, self as everybody else is just fuck you, creates those sociopaths which create imbalance. 
if you've got somebody who's just overly empathetic, a bleeding heart, and has no respect for themselves. They're always running around like crazy, like ants, trying to serve everybody else, but they can't even do that because they can't fucking, they don't have no respect for themselves. So you always have that imbalance because, I mean, all is serving what you would consider the creation, you know? It's just that some are more beneficial than others. It seems that even through, and this is really funny too, that there's more damage from one serving oneself over others, and it causes more damage than one trying to serve self over others. Like, and even being in the imbalance, because you know there's different imbalances. And I would argue that they're equally bad. It's but almost like the balance between selfishness and selflessness. Yeah. That you Agreeableness see versus disagreeableness. Yeah. And, like, if you want to liken it to, like, male and female forces, because that's, again, the Chinese culture, yin and yang. Yang is the male force. Yin is the female force. Yin is receiving, nurturing. Yang is more outgoing and direct. Uh, yin moves in circles. Yang moves in straight lines. I've heard the yin and yang symbol be described as the masculine and feminine mm-hmm. and the polarity of those two. I've also had I've heard it be described as the polarity the duality, whatever you want to say, yeah. of uh, chaos and order. Chaos and order, yes. Um, yeah, order. Which, it, which order attributed to the masculine and mm-hmm. the feminine attributed to chaos. Yeah, and that is through all secret societies, through all religions <coughs> and things like that. It's a part important thing to understand is polarity in its sense. Is that polarity spans across everything. And if you understand that everything is a male and female expression of the universe because that's how that duality is separated, then e- then you figure out a lot of stuff. Like, day, male. Night, female. You see? Mm. And because the night nurtures, you sleep, you stop, you rest, and you heal when you sleep. Interesting perspective. Yeah, and then the, the sun comes up. You, you're you active. You're moving. You're productive. You know, you have goals. Wait, how do you explain Alaska? 24 like, yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, like, the, you see those representations of different things. Like, light is more of a stripping, baking, cooking um, kind of thing. And your body needs that to cleanse itself because it needs to make vitamin D3 and needs to do a lot of things that are only activated by the sun. But the moon and the darkness, again, more healing stuff, you know? And... Uh, even getting into like alchemy and stuff like that because I delved into that. They follow those same concepts, which is really interesting that even like the, the chemicals obey those same laws. And uh, yeah, the, and even through astrology, the moon represents the mother, or the emotions, you know, and then the sun represents your personality and the w- how you pr- present out to the world. That it's been intrinsically put. Like look at electricity. It's so funny. Okay, when you say, hey, the male part of the plug, what's the male part? The mo- male part's one looks like the penis. Right. The female part's the receiving one. Like it's it's the same thing. That uh, even the receiving part of electricity is the female part of the electricity. It's in polarity. It's naturally in everything. And so, like, you look at the ancient religions and stuff like that, they really understood that. And that's where the concept of God and the devil, and that's just a concept. I don't go, uh, there's so many people that are just like, that's real. It's, it, was, it wasn't thought of until after Christianity was already there. They didn't have that. that w- the church made that up. The church literally made up heaven and hell. Like, it's even been proven fucking through history that the church made up that concept that they even twisted the language when you go back to the translations of what the word hell was and what the word is. It's fucking, like, he was, and this is... I thought that through at a young age. Yeah. At a very young age, I was like, there's no way. There's yeah. no way. No, it, no, it just there's no seemed way there's illogical. Yeah, I know the same for me. But from a young age, I'm just like, I love people. Could I send my dad to hell and forever? I couldn't do that. I'd always forgive him. Plus, how could you blame? Okay, if somebody is going to be grown up and they they inherited these arbitrary parents, mm-hmm. inherited this arbitrary environment, yeah, you maybe they, were, they had some sense of neglected upbringing and that drove them to act on very, very malevolent impulses mm-hmm. and they carried out those impulses and they became a murderer. I'm not justifying murder, but you know, some no, you're fine. there might have been I don't some have any conceptual developmental predisposition to why these kids are the way they were, or like why yeah. these why like why their actions manifested themselves. That's like, correct. I you believe know, why, that's why, as why well. not consider them as well. nurturing as well? Mm-hmm. Why why would that person go to hell? Because they had they inherited this very random. Yeah. 
nurturing part of their lives which caused them to do this and yeah mm -hmm. if you want to believe in agency and free will then you could always say well no they did they didn't have to kill them but why did they kill them and it was most likely yeah. due to something why? with them why or maybe they have some fucking crazy mm -hmm. hormonal imbalance that made them want to carry out these that, crazy things i think that you're like very much i agree with everything that you say um, and that's the things that we have to look at as individuals. See, you, you're looking at something through a logical and loving standpoint. You're stepping back. See, how do you get people to make irrational decisions? You have them emotionally react. That is horrible! <laughs> and you make illogical decisions. And the, I mean, the media uses that, everything. Religion uses fear to have an emotional response. So you, oh, this is wrong. Uh, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Uh, it's unspeakable. So you don't think about it, you know, and that's the that's the tactics. And so when you actually logically think about something, you humanize, you humanize the killer, you humanize the villain. There's reasons that they got there. It be chemical, it be emotional. Most times emotional. Most that's so times accurate. they were created. Humanizing. Yeah, humanizing. Humanizing. Use it. We're all they are human. human. Yeah, they're a human at the end of the day. They're a human at the end of the they're day. They're not a killer. I mean, yeah. yes, they killed. <laughs> yeah, they killed. And you know, we again. It's really interesting. I, I don't know why that spoke to me so much, but that really did. Um, good, perfect, perfect example here is something that we're not taught. Now, we know that Columbus was an asshole, even though we were taught he was the one who discovered America, which he never discovered America. He discovered Cuba, and he thought it was America, but then he did come there. Now, he was the first one to start the sex trade, which most people don't know. He started— Sex trade of um, uh, like, the Aborigines? Yeah, sex trade of Aborigines. Like, he w got all the women, like, that were Native Americans, and he was like, the sailors all raped them all and beat them to death, and then he's like, hey— I can make money off of this. So he captured them all, the children, and because a lot of the Europeans, unfortunately, they had a lot of big pedophile rings that were going on over there. Like, pedophilia really traced back a long time. So there were, they wanted children, they wanted women. And so he provided that. He was one of the first people to do that over, over in America. So he started that. He was a son of a bitch. He was a slave thing. He beat them to death. He raped them. He did everything. And we look, we have a Columbus Day. Fuck him. He was like, now, there's that. And then... What they don't teach you, because this is how fucking, like, they talked to a guy at the Smitho Smithsonian, and he's like, this is unfortunate, and he was actually bashing mainstream curriculum, somebody who was fucking part of the Smithsonian, that is, like, part of mainstream curriculum, and the reason that he was bashing, and he's like, they tell me to teach everybody this, and he said, what most people don't understand, and only a few of us understand, which soon will be not many, is how many Native Americans were actually on the continent of America. He said that, and how advanced that they were. He said because they taught, every, they continually teach everybody that they were savages. And they were talking about that that's not true at all, that they wrote history completely ass backwards, is that... This is something I've really wanted to talk to you yeah. about. Now, here's the thing is they had this string of cities where you know the, where the mountains are in Missouri that's part of that city that they had a working city that was 10 times the size of New, New York and they had working water they had inside they, they had so much technology that the Europeans didn't have but they were a loving culture that was not violent and so when the Europeans came over they saw all that and they said they even have writings from Indians to Indians, or like, excuse me, Native Americans to Native Americans that were saying that they were trying to help the Europeans understand what it was to bathe. That they said that in their culture, that they understood that bathing on a frequent basis was cleansing of oneself, and that they t said that the Europeans were silly because they tried to teach them how to bathe, but they were like, nah, I don't need to bathe. And that's the opposite way that we were kind of taught. We were taught that, oh, we taught them how to do use hygiene and everything. That, no, the Europeans fucking didn't bathe for long periods of time because they were used to coming over from those kingdoms where they poured shit into the damn... They just poured their buckets of shit out the window. And they didn't have access to bathing, so they didn't bathe for months and months and months at a time. And so they were dirty as fuck. And they were deranged and everything. And they came over there and they were violent. You know, we think that our, our ancestors were really good people. No, they were thugs. We just took over this whole place. Even our forefathers, which were wise, and most of them were Masons. They were the higher class. But yeah, the Puritans that came over, most of them had syphilis. They were fucking deranged, and they just believed in such extreme versions of what God was. 
You know, they would kill people. And then we had the Dark Ages, and fuck that. They literally sawed people in half because they thought they were witches, and they sawed them from the genitals. They p- tortured them, did all sorts of horrible things, most unspeakable things to women. And you know why? Is because they were children of nature. They believed in observing nature, doing herbalism, which they didn't understand. They thought that was magic. To, so going yeah. back to the Native yeah. Americans, mm-hmm. what were their... Um, what, what do you think drove their culture to be so benevolent? Um, I would say nature, again. nature. They had a really strong connection with nature. Yeah, they had a really strong connection with nature and the earth. They didn't think it was something to be conquest. They didn't have a, again, they didn't have a pyr- pyramid system of a ruler. You know, they had a chief, which was elected, you know. I mean, in some cultures, there was a bloodline that came to that. We, we always kind of tend to come to those bloodline things. Do you think any of it has to do with the fact that it was... I'm assuming smaller populations. Actually, they, that's the lie. Is it was larger populations. We had like like we genocided fifty times what we've actually wrote about, and that's what they were what? talking about. Yeah, the we murdered so much that we murdered the equivalent of like what a world war was, and that's the unfortunate thing is we literally killed. Because I'm imagining of, whenever I'm imagining like the Sioux, right? Yeah, like hundreds. We were oh, like a hundred, hundreds like, of thousands, maybe. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like, and it's more than I'm that. It's millions. Like, it's millions and millions and millions. Well, of even that, even like a hundred thousand, sounds insane to yeah. me. I was, I was imagining something like. Well, think about what like it, I, this think might sound really ignorant to me, but like two thousand. Yeah, well, 2000, like no, I'm imagining it's what, very, it's what very taught. small tribes. Like I couldn't believe when he said of ten times the size of New York, ten times the size of New York. That's insane. Yeah, that we literally just wrote off like, and they said that it was all because of because we integrated with them and we killed them just like. Because we have that natural, like, all races have this natural ingrained genetic, like, you're different than me kind of thing. And it's called, uh, well, I mean, it's not racial. We we call it today racial profiling, but it's an ingrained reaction that that shows you about, like, there's a really big controversy about how— Condition response. Yeah, condition response, but also the fact that we may not have came from the same origin, and that's interesting. Um, Because we naturally have that, you know, thing, but you're different than me kind of thing and so like playing off of that there was this one guy and I can't remember I wish I could remember the name but like okay we're integrating we're killing them but it's not that big yet we're just trying to integrate into America and this one guy wrote in it remember how we were talking about humanization he wrote a book just talking about how they were savages used a word just a word did this and changed the perspective of people painted them as savages it's not easy to kill a human because they're human. You know, they have a family. They have this and that. But a savage. I can kill a savage. Right? Almost, see, uh, that, that word to me, at least whenever you're applying it to, mm. you know, Aborigines, like, like Aboriginal uh, that they'll kill you. kind they're, of cultures. They'll take your babies. They'll kill you. They, they'll do all these things. It's you like, it, it kinda, you kind of justify in your mind, it's, okay, mm-hmm. kill them before they kill me. Mm-hmm. Fuck you. Like, you say fuck you, I say fuck you back. Yeah. yeah. And so that was it. That one book created the perspective of what they were and they dehumanized them and it was a strategic thing because they wanted industry the guy who wrote that book was part of the bankers families and things like that they wanted to take over the whole place and they knew that they had to remove the indigenous people it all goes back to greed yeah it all goes back that's to greed. absolutely insane there um uh, there's it's an author i really like i'm a huge fan of this guy he wrote the the book sec uh sex at dawn and he also has a new book out uh, called Civilized to Death, but his name's Chris Ryan. Mm-hmm. And I was listening to a podcast with him recently, and something he said that really stuck out to me is that he was surprised while he was doing all this research to look pretty much to study the fundamental roots of human sexuality. And oh, yeah. he kind of he kind of challenges monogamy and different co- yeah, social which constructs is and whatnot. Understandably uh, challenged, yeah, because like I mean, it's not. I think it's a choice, but it's not natural. Arguably, yeah. arguably, yeah. yeah. It's Good not, point. yeah, because that's the whole thing is it's not, it's not natural, but it's it's chose upon. And sometimes, like even animals do choose one mate, but sometimes they choose multiple mates. It's just again, it, it tends more so to be a choice. And I don't believe in restricting that choice. I mean, because yeah, some people work best to express themselves. Some people just express themselves through sex. And that sex shouldn't be such this taboo thing. I think that's what caused a lot of repression, a lot of violence, is the fact that we repress sex so much. And I think that that was strategically done as well. 
Mm. Because like religion really caused a lot of sex repression. And look at all the horrible things we got out of that. Um, and so like a lot of the cultures that actually had it more of a free choice and made it more of a sacred thing um, did better. Were more benevolent. Mm. Yeah. And so like. But g- going back to what he yeah, said. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he said he was just flabbergasted. I don't even know if I'm using that word correctly. Yeah, just, yeah. just fucking mind blown about how much oppression of these aboriginal cultures was like and how much how much pretty much all with the agenda of supporting civilization yeah. how much how much propaganda went into just supporting this system that we have in place right now absolutely absolutely that's um, insane to me hey if this is still on youtube i'm not sure um you might enjoy this very much and there's some of the best uh, like archive footage from this which i really enjoyed and it shows like how how the whole like entire world is controlled by psychology and the different modality i keep going to use the damn word modality today i've noticed that yeah i know like i think i'm too much modality um okay but different uh different like structures and ideas um were all based upon psychology and the rise of psychology and it was all based upon freud is that when america was just kind of becoming itself you had the industrial revolution right and so then we just didn't know how to integrate that right we were trying to learn how to integrate that we had government we're trying to all this technology that we're coming across and so then you have the rise of the corporation at first government and corporation were really separate right and all because of one man and this is like what you see that this ruined our society um it made the corporation take over it was freud's nephew is that freud like was over in Germany, and nobody read his shit. They thought he was a quack, right? But, like, his nephew was one of those people that would be more along the sociopathic line. He liked to control large groups of people, and he was just really a swindler, could really talk. He went over to America. He saw that all this was happening, kind of pre-saw this, and he's like, hmm. And so he promoted Freud's work to everybody over and saying, this works, this is the thing. This is what you can use to make sell more things to people. And he, like, one of the things that he did that sh- kind of what people grabbed onto was, uh, which this, because, you know, Freud did have some concepts that actually worked. But a lot of them were fucked up too, right? And, like, a lot of people don't <laughs> think about, like, he did enough cocaine to fucking kill t- 50 people. He was a coke, super coke addict. He thought the coke was the best. He even wrote about how he thought coke was a miracle drug back when coke was actually legal. Um, And so, like, he had some distorted ideas. Well, one of the ideas that he had, which worked for the corporations, is the corporations are coming up. They're making uh, streamlined box things. We don't really have diversity yet. We just have, like, you know, a common cake mix, a common thing, a common this. And so, like, most people that made cakes for their husbands and shit like that because that was solely a woman's job back then was to do the baking and the cooking and the men went to work and that was the structure and so they used to love to prepare meals for their husband and made them feel like worthwhile and so the psychology of it was like when they had these box cakes that were just like instant you just mix them together cake they didn't feel like they were doing something for their husbands so people weren't buying it and they're like why are people not buying it and, and like so he's like, hey, you know, this is my, you know, uh, what would what a nephew be to a, with a what would that be, grandfather? Uncle. Uncle? Oh, yeah, uncle. Thank you. Um, my uncle, here, this is one of the concepts. Let's see if we can apply this. It's because they don't feel worthwhile to their husbands. And they don't feel like they can offer them anything. What does a, a woman offer their husband? What's one of the most primal things? A child, right? An egg, an embryo. He's like, I know these cakes don't need an egg. Add an egg. Say, say that they have to get an egg and crack it into the mix for it to work. And you'll sell more. And so that's why we mix you know, eggs and cake mixes today. It's not because they need that egg. You know, Now we say that we make them in the way that they do, but they didn't back then. They made it all together. And so he just said by adding the egg, it represents fertility and giving the husband something which is a child. And then they tripled sales. And so then they're like, wow, this works. And so then they're like, this new Do you think it was also the contribution of a contribution, doing something Doing themselves? something for you, doing something themselves, yeah. So it's like, not only that, but see, that's where the distortion was. It's like, there's several different things going into that. And, you know, 
again, how psychology works is not black and white. It's human consciousness. Now, okay, that worked. And so they're like, ooh, this new psychology thing. Let's take this in. So the corporation started to take in psychology. And the first psychology that they took into selling products was Freud. And so then he tried to escape the war and he came over uh, to America. And then they started selling his books, which his books sold out. And he was one of the first people that the, all the corporations actually took in, which his psychology was pretty like now we're like, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, you know, but then that's what they used to sell people shit. And so they had that and then he like integrated them in and then you had uh, like Ayn Rand and everybody and fucking like so then all the way up to the Vietnam War that they tried to apply a lot of the psychology to the traumas of people in, in the Vietnam War and veterans from that, and it didn't work. And, like, they severely failed because their structure, well, Freud's structure was that all emotion is irrational and should be repressed. That for someone to be a functional person in society, that repression was a big thing, that you needed to control your emotions to be a productive member of society. And so this created all this repression. And then, like, it, well, it moves on from there. But the, the documentary on this, if it's still on YouTube, is called The Century of the Self and shows... That's, that's what I have my phone out for. Yeah. Century of the Self? Yeah, Century of the Self. And that it shows you that the whole destruction and to interwoven, like, how the corporations dominated was all because of that one motherfucker, the Freud's nephew which was a very wicked individual, which, because, like, he saw that the corporations were rising and government was rising at the same time, and they kind of opposed each other. Because, again, government actually had, at one point, had the rights of the people in mind before it was corrupted, and the corporation had self-interest in mind. And so he's like, the way that this is going to survive, and he told the corporations this, is if you interweave them together, because government won't go away. And so he married them together to where that they would be always looked at as one by the public eye and then put their interests together and then eventually wrote laws into it to where they would be in forever into Do they do they actually want the public eye to see them as as one? Yeah, they wanted that at yeah, but to Why did they want the public eye? That just seems to, to support the corporations to not be self-interest but to have their interest in mind like the government was being pitched to have. Oh. Yeah. But See, my thoughts are I just start looking at this and yeah, I don't know. I, I just think that gets really squirrely and it starts supporting the corporations. Yeah, exactly. Like, what's the end result actually going to be? It's going to be this. capitalism. This. The monetary incentive. Yeah. Who rules Who rules the world at the current moment? The corporation. Who rules the, rules the United States? The corporation. Like, again, the government just panders to all of those companies because they would crush the government. They are above. They don't even pay fucking taxes. Like Jeff Bezos, the guy, the CEO of fucking Amazon, he didn't pay a dime last year. Is he being jailed? Is there anything like that? No. They excused him. He's above the law. He makes too much money. And that's the thing, is the corporations now rule. That's, that's what you got from that. And you already saw that, again, if people thought logically and weren't so excited about all this new technology, when the same thing's happening over again, we got phones, we got phones, 5G. And that's the most like, there's people all around the world that's like, that's the worst invention ever, that we don't understand the technology that we're going to fucking like all get cancer and die. Because like, yeah, 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 that's what's fucking going to happen is because they're the, like, okay, a microwave, right, works at so many cycles per second. Now we all know to not, turn a microwave on and stand next to it for a long amount of time. Imagine if you did that all day long, right? Mm -hmm. You'd eventually fucking get brain cancer or be stupid as fuck. You know, your, your d DNA would start to fucking fry. These phones produce even more radiation already than a microwave. Now, 5G would quadruple that amount of radiation, which would be like even more than quadruple what a fucking microwave produces constantly being beamed into your phone which is targeted so if that wasn't enough that like they had a whole bunch of people talk about like you know how we had 3g 4g and fu like you know all that all, all the way up that they were using the same kind of like upgraded technology that 5g is actually a government technology that was actually pulled from like top secret files that when people asked about it they said through the um what is it the patriot act 
that they are not allowed to ask about it or know about it because it actually would like uh what it would like uh it's top secret stuff that would like cause like terrorism blah 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 all the bullshit right and so we have a s- top secret military technology that's going to be used for our phones that nobody can ask about and then that they were prepping 5G for years and that they steamrolled all of the governments that nobody really ever actually approved it because nobody got information. The people that did approve it, they said that they were just handed stuff and they're just like, well, hey, what about this? Has this been tested? And they're like, uh, well, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, been, it's been seen as safe. And did you know that there's been no active tests on 5G whatsoever? They're rolling out something that's never been tested. Never been tested. Is there active tests on it currently? No. There's not one open active test on testing to see if it's safe for human beings right now. But now... What do you think the agenda of having all this radiation would be? Now, this is really... This really gets fucked up because, like, okay, well, let's look. There's more. That um, we already have looked at Wi-Fi and how it, like, completely stops the growth of human life at this current time. That, like, when we put seeds next to, like, just a router... Like, there was a whole bunch of children that did this, that they wouldn't grow. And then when they took them away, those same seeds could grow. That it actually destroyed, the, like, the whole structure. Which, that's understandable, but again, common science says non-ionizing radiation shouldn't do that. But it's, again, you look into that, it's a bunch of bullshit. Radiation's radiation, it does tear apart stuff. Um, now, you have to look at, okay, there's something... I forget what it is, but it's like a sonic gun that we have. They don't really talk about this that much because it's not top secret, but it's something that the military uses. All it does is uses sound waves that are so incredibly low that they actually cause uh, cells to separate. So you can literally liquefy someone's organs by uh, like putting a sound wave into them. And it was for, it was designed, those big guns were designed for people that were inside tanks that they couldn't penetrate. Uh So they just, and it's like lower than what anyone can hear and would literally liquefy their organs. Holy shit. And so just that is a common technology that we've used for a long time. So you see how vibration, which that's what these are using, they're using specific vibration frequencies through radiation. Through using radiation, which are just, okay, now, okay, we say radiation, but they're radio waves. That's all it is. They're radio waves. But what we can do with radio waves and radio radiation is amazing. That the Russians experimented with in the 1960s, now we're reusing that technology, is what the Russians were trying to do with it was mind control. They found that by beaming um, specific frequencies at crowds of people that they could disorient them and make them make certain decisions based upon their disorientation. And then they found that if you beam certain lower tone frequencies that are not uh, audible, that it creates terror and fear in somebody and they don't understand why. Unnecessary fear. Unnecessary fear. And so now here's the interesting thing is we use that currently. Okay? How? Get directors of horror movies. They say they play unaudible or low tones below the thing to make people feel uncomfortable right before a drastic thing. That's used currently. The people understand that. So it's used in the entertainment industry. It's used in the entertainment industry. What else is it used in? Now, here's the thing is we really kind of shuffled that to the side. That was uh, like understood knowledge. Now, our phones constantly, that's, you know how when you put it next to a radio, you hear it's like going like that constantly that's constantly happening those are vibration frequencies that are happening to your phone and that each communication is a different vibration frequency that can be utilized because now you have a target you're not just beaming something you have something that's vibrating at a certain frequency you can vibrate this motherfucker at any frequency you want let's say you wanted me to be anxious let's say that because my phone measures my location and everything like that I'm walking by a whole bunch of stores you want me to buy something right you know most people buy to make themselves feel whole you want to make me feel anxious. So you could beam a certain frequency that makes me feel more anxious. So I'm just oh, God, fucking, ah, ah, I need to feel comfortable. I'm going to go get a drink. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. You could just modify behavior by subtleties like that, let alone like God knows what else we've come in fucking 40, 50 years from what the Russians uh, like experimented with. Because like they even had scientists come out that you said that you could use certain frequencies to literally induce states of consciousness and it was really easy and they found that all out 
And I mean, we don't just be like, oh, we can manipulate large things to people and make them feel certain ways that only we can, can control. Ah, we're not going to use that. Of course we are. Yeah, of course we are. And now we are using in the 5G that specific technology that has a frequency band and like velocity of frequency that is beyond anything we've ever had before. And now, if that wasn't enough, you know how we have towers right now? They were actually releasing over, what is it, 5,000 um, uh, satellites in space that are going to beam down 5G. So it's going to cover whole cities. So, like, this is the most fucked up thing we're allowing to happen ever. Like, when this happens, you're going to see an increase of, like, cancer exponentially. We're already seeing it because they've already been rolling out 5G for years in like underneath our noses and they literally have steamrolled all of the law all of our policies all of everything they're just like you're going to take it this is what you're getting and they're only phone companies but they have military back technology right now and they have the most money out of anything because they've become the conglomerate because everybody has a phone and it's perfect it's a fucking device that's on you that they can beam any frequency they want to I mean look at that it's the most insidious stupid thing because everybody wants one of these not only can, can you control people through what they want to see and get dopamine hits and shit like that that you can surveil somebody you can get their location you can beam frequencies into this motherfucking phone when you turn it off it still communicates it still communicates with everything all the apps on your fucking phone that there's never an off button like that's why if you turn your phone off for a long time let it sit down for like you know about a week it's dead and everybody's like, oh, the battery just drains. Those ion batteries don't drain. They can fucking, years, won't drain. But it drains in your phone. It's not like a car battery. It doesn't work like that. It's draining because it's still on. It's still communicating with all the apps on your phone. And that's just something, like, Ed, like Edward Snowden's a really good one to watch on Joe Rogan podcast because he interviewed him, and he talks about that. He I talks about half of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've watched about like maybe three quarters and things like that, um, because like uh, again, like I, I love Edward Snowden for what he did, but like he initially was like really naive and like, oh, go government, go government, go government. I was never like that, and so <laughs> like yeah, and so a lot of his viewpoints. I'm glad that he came around and saw that. That's why he had the wherewithal and the, the idea to do that. Because a lot of people that think like me, I'm I also self self-preservation is important to me as well i would have whistle i just would have taken a different thing like i just there's mindsets about people who suspect things and things like that and how to get out and how to infiltrate and things it's just that he came from a much more honest and he was the one who needed to do that that's what the expression of that was but i think that he missed out on a lot of things that actually happened underneath his nose that like fucking 9-11 inside job doesn't really even talk about that oh my god like, that's just ridiculously, like, obvious just through all the science and everything like that. I'm not even coming from that from, like, a, a thing. It's just that, like, President Bush slipped up and talked about bombs the first time he fucking, like, was briefing it. He goes, the bombs and the explosions went off on the third floor, and then the planes. He, he said that. They had Cheney, Bush, and a whole bunch of other people from that family had a, what, what do they call think tank? They got together. And they said, what would it take, because his, his family wanted to go to the war with, uh, like, Saudi Arabia, because there were, like, they were paying the Bush family, because, again, like, Osama bin Laden and things like that, he worked for the CIA, and that's openly spoken about, right? He worked for the CIA. Uh, they had a whole bunch of, his father had a whole bunch of things to where they were trading back and forth for weapons, and that the Saudi Arabians were paying them money, Okay. Shit happened between them. They had a falling out. The money that they owed them, they didn't pay them, okay? He went to war, the first war with them, with Grenada and shit like that. Didn't go over. He didn't create the war that he wanted, right? He wasn't voted back into office, right? Okay, that happened. Son gets voted into office, wants to finish his dad's job, okay? They have a think tank that says, which in this think tank... They actually had leaked documents from this, and it was really, really wasn't tried to cover up that much at all, that they even had drills that they gave to the military and the Air Force about what would happen if two planes hit the World Trade Center, like, what is it, six or nine months beforehand? There's proof of this. There's proof of this. And, like, this, here's the thing. Now, I mean, all that aside, right, 
they went into this think tank and they said, what would it take to benefit the economy and um, you know, achieve what they wanted to achieve? And they said it would take another war, right? And they said, well, what would create another war? And they thought, and this is like not even hidden stuff, and they said another Pearl Harbor event. That's what would it, it would take. And that what would be another Pearl Harbor event? Like, you know, that. And s- they said that, that w- an act of terrorism would be what it would take to create another war. And they thought they would d- have, in that think tank, it would be necessary to benefit our economy. So there's that. And then you have the fact that those buildings, all of those buildings, were built to withstand impact. They were built to withstand earthquakes, impact. They even built them to withstand jetliners. Okay? Now, when something gets hit, which there have been other buildings that have been hit that weren't even constructed as well as them, by planes and bigger planes. None of them have ever fell. Steel melts at 25,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which no jet fuel can burn at ever in any circumstance. Right? When they removed like all the rubble and things like that, the steel beams were heated so incredibly hot that they were in puddles. They were melted into puddles. That steel beams were melted into puddles from jet fuel. And the fact of like logically, if it hit midstream, it would fall like this. The foundation wouldn't crumble straight down. When you demolish a building, it falls straight on itself, right? And like everybody, that's the whole thing, is a whole bunch of professors and people came forward. They're like, no, those were, demo- those were demolished. Like so many people came out and was just like, that's not, that's not what happened. Like even before they knew anything is because they're just like, this doesn't happen. We're engineers. We know this. You know, and half of the people that actually built that motherfucker either disappeared or like when they spoke out against it, they were just shut up. Because like they found thermite throughout that building. And thermite can... Heat can be heated over 25,000 degrees. I mean, these are just common things that we found. All of the th- fucking, like, people that went in there said that they saw, they uh, heard explosions and floors blew out and things like that. And all the fucking, l- like, a lot of the firemen that actually spoke out again, they weren't the ones that were put on TV. Were the ones that went in there first. It was all the ones that came in after and rescued all these people and they uh, glorified them and everything. But the ones who went in there first were like, well, there's bombs in there. They didn't think it was because they didn't see the plane. They didn't know. They just responded and they were like, oh my God, you know, bombs and this and that and the other thing. And then the most obvious one is nobody talks about Building 7, right? Okay? Nobody talks about th- these couple facts. Is that the guy who owns those buildings a couple months beforehand took out a massive insurance policy on all three buildings. I've never heard this. I've yeah. never heard this part of the story. Now, took out a massive thing. Now, that's the first thing to look at. And the stipulations of that insurance policy is that he wouldn't get a payout unless all three buildings were demolished. Right? Now, there's that. He is part of a group called the Bilderbergs. Right? The Bilderbergs are an elite group of people that are prime ministers, kings and queens, some of the richest CEOs in the world, and they meet secretly all around the world. And they discuss economic and political movements. They actually are so secretive that hardly anybody can find them, but people have traced them around, and they literally buy out whole motels and things like that, and they buy private security that will kill people if they try to get across. But they never telegraph where they're going to be. Now, that's been followed by Alex Jones and other people that like would be considered conspiracy theorists, but no, the people that you see go into these things are like dictators, presidents, Uh, prime ministers, royalty, and they're the only people to go to this, and the most rich people on earth. And usually what they say is when things were leaked and people found out what they were talking about, they were talking about either population control, they were talking about, like, the economic, like, transfer, like, all the bankers go to it, and everything like that. So he was part of that group, right? That's a flag already. He pulls out this insurance thing months before, and it has to be all three buildings, There was only two buildings that were hit. Building 7, the third building, nobody talks about it, it completely collapsed, just like them. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere, just collapsed. And they said, well, how did that happen? Uh, There was a fire that was started. 
Okay, if we're going with a theory that jet fuel melted the beams, which is already ludicrous, and made these buildings collapse perfectly like they were demolished, which is unheard of, unbelievable in any form or fashion, that this other thing, the trash fire was started and, and the whole building collapsed. Because all three buildings, for him to get that insurance payout, out, pay out, had to be demolished. Oh. So that's the only reason it fell. Yeah. So, I mean, that's it. Is like so what's the, what's the incentive for 9-11 to happen again? I don't know if I fully understand that. that um, oh, what, crea- what creating a war, one for with the Saudi Indian, Arabia. With Saudi Arabia. So is it over well, oil? Well, I don't I, I no, no I, like oil was a, like subsidiary. You get a whole bunch of things. Think about like multiple benefits. Like when you start a war, which is funded and paid out by a lot of people that like because a lot of their families own weapons companies and own the things, so they get a whole bunch of money from that. And then you also have him going after like fucking Haddam Hussein, which owed him a shit ton of money. Uh, that there was a big old gold grab that they went through and they grabbed a whole bunch of money. Like, that was, like, I, f- I followed that throughout the whole thing. You got the oil, right? And then you have um, people reacting out of fear through a mass, like, whatever event so we can pass a whole bunch of laws. That's where the Patriot, that's where the, like, uh, what was it called? Yeah, I think the Patriot Act was passed, which allowed the NSA to take over everything. And in the name of terrorism, they could take away all your rights. That's how that happened. That would have never happened, and we still had some rights left before that happened. It was a power grab. And so, literally, they ended so many people's lives because the sociopathic nature of, it doesn't matter, it created the desired effect. Like they said, they needed a Pearl Harbor event. They said this, it's on paper. And so, like, despite all the scientific facts about the fucking buildings and everything like that, it shows that it wasn't what it was, that no one really actually ever saw a plane, the, 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 the v- footage that we saw was extremely doctored, like, and there was even one that, like... So what, d- what does America have to gain? America has nothing to gain from it. It's literally the Bush family? Yeah. The Bush family's been, like, half of them were Nazis. Like, they traced back to, like, when um, that a lot of the rich families and everything like that, and, like, like not Bush Sr., but the Bush before that, um, was openly supporting the Nazis. And, like, that's the whole thing. And they came from, like, this whole, like, oh, really wicked Satanistic kind of, uh, oh, what do you call it, um, Luciferianist background that they were super, and I don't like to smear the name occultist because the cult does not mean evil. But when I say occultist, I mean more so of the Luciferian belief system. And that that's what he was. And him uh, and, like, two others, which were, I think, the Rockefellers and the Morgans, and I think even the well, the Rothschilds took ca- ca- kind of hold of Europe, so it wasn't them. So it was those two others that wrote during the war when the Nazis were really taking over stuff. They said that uh, that America and their concepts were weak, and that we should, as a nation, to become stronger, adopt more of the fascism ideas of Hitler and everything like that. And they fucking wrote this, and they put this, and they presented this to our government. They presented this to a lot of people. And uh, then when we lost, they kind of... mm. But yeah, all of them really wanted that. And so you come from that, and then you come into, like, uh, the fact of looking at how the Bush family got uh, Bush Sr. into presidency. He didn't just get it because the people picked him. It's because his running mate dropped out. His running mate dropped out because he was getting threatened of death by people that he said was hooked to the Bush family. Is that nobody else would go up against Bush Sr. That's how that happened. Not because people wanted him in there. And then during his thing, we had a small war, you know? And like a whole bunch of horrible things. Like Bush Sr. also was the head of the CIA for a while. Like, there's so much connections, and their family is wicked as fuck. They have a lot of money stored that not many people know about. And, like, that's why, like, when Bush Sr. was starting to get a little senile and shit like that, and he was saying shit that they didn't want him out in the public is because he was saying shit that he didn't need to be saying. You know, and they're like, oh, he's crazy, don't worry, ha-ha. Because they've done so many horrible things. They've murdered so many people for, like, this Luciferian agenda that they're part of. And they're all in the skull and bones. All of them. 
all of them are in the skull and bones. And when they like people have snuck in and shit like that, like the literally, which this is a ritual, which they say, oh, it's just hazing, whatever. That they have this special ritual that they put you in a coffin, and this is how you get in there. Put you in a coffin, which represents the death of. Um, this is another one that does this. There's many different things. The death of uh, what is it? The death of either empathy or the death of uh, caring. The death of caring. The death of caring. And what you have to do is you have to embarrass yourself while dying, right? Is by jerking off in front of everybody. This is the fucking ritual that you do. So you get into the coffin and you masturbate in front of everybody representing the death of caring. And like even though that sounds like a crazy enough little thing to do is that like Bush Sr. requested a front row seat to see his son masturbate in a coffin to represent what that was. So, like, you look at that these, these groups, which when you all trace them back, they all have this Luciferianistic, and that's beyond Satanism. That's something that comes from Mithraism, which, again, we talked about the male and the female forces. And uh, just th what they believe is, again, integrated into the Masons, too, because they infiltrated the Masons. So all of these secret societies are literally the ones that are ru ruling our government, and they all believe, and it doesn't matter. Now, this is what I tell everybody. It doesn't matter what is true. And it doesn't matter if these people believe in something that's completely ridiculous and not true. But what matters is they believe in it. And they're going to act upon those beliefs. And so if they believe in something that's like, you need to kill all babies and drink their blood, to be like, that's ridiculous. Who cares? They believe in it and they're in power. Right? And so a lot of these people believe some pretty extreme things which I do believe somewhat are based upon truths because, you know, even the worst lies are based upon truth. And that that's what's unfortunate is that's what, like I told you, remember how I told you the uh, Scientology people infiltrated a whole bunch of stuff? We saw back in the 1800s that the Masons did the same thing, that there was this one Mason because they said that Masons don't talk about Masons. And this is how we got, like, the different degrees of Masonry and you know, stuff was because of this one guy, he wrote about it, Right? And they said they were never supposed to be written about. It's a secret society. He wrote about it, and a whole bunch of the guys got together, and they fucking murdered him. They hung him, right? And they were reprimanded for that because they weren't supposed to openly do that, but that was the rule. You did, that's what you did. And so when they actually went after the guys that they said did it, 80% of, well, like, around, like, most of the people and the judges and everybody were all Masons, and they pardoned them because they already infiltrated all of that, and they knew that they weren't going to put their, their brethren in there. So they excused them for the hanging and murder of that, and that was, like, one of the first cases that showed how powerful a secret society could be because they could just infiltrate all forms of government, and that was their ideal. That's what they wanted to do, to create ultimate shadow control. And that was the Masons, which we, like a lot of people, oh, Masons are good. They've been infiltrated as well. Again, like you have all these like different dark hidden forces that think they hold the truth, which a lot of them hold a lot of things that I would say are true, uh, but they slant towards a negative, you know. Like there's a lot of esoteric stuff that I study that the Masons knew hundreds and thousands of years ago. And they just kept that secret, you know. They, like Masons, even though they hide behind Christianity, they admit about a chakra system. They teach that, and they teach about geometries that a lot of, um, a lot of quantum physics already under now are just coming to understand. They, they, think they talk about ley lines and energy fields, and they believe that everything's dimensional. Like, they've believed this for thousands of years, and this is something that they've known is because they knew something. And we've, we're, again, we're just coming back to that but we've known this for centuries, and that's what's really interesting. That's why we have the pyramid, which is like fucking, like the Great Pyramid is something that, um, it's lied, like, okay, it's based off of pi, right? And it also has the phi ratio woven into it perfectly. It, the, it's so incredibly wide that even our greatest architects today can't lay down a foundation as flat that it spans that, that length and only deviates by under an inch. That when you take perfect north, which is not even measurable by a compass, and then line it up with the pyramid, that it only deviates by three degrees on any side. 
that it perfectly lines up with the precession of the equinoxes to, again, three degrees. The curvature of that and how it goes up, like uh, the arc, I forget even what it was, is so perfectly lined up that we can't replicate that today. Um, the, the blocks are pressed together so finely and have a concrete like substance between them that we can't even fit a piece of paper in between them. They're actually pressed together more tightly than the panels are on a NASA spaceship. Holy shit. All of these things are facts about the Great Pyramid. That if you take the Egyptian inches from like top to bottom, it <laughs> now this is a weird coincidence, that it actually equals the same amount of seconds that the speed of light travels. That if you take the pyramid in its inches once again and take the highest level of like above sea level and the lowest level and divide that by the Great Pyramid, it's perfect. It, it says, like, if you took the Great Pyramid and said, oh, if I looked at this and did this and did that, it perfectly divides into that. So the highest point and the lowest point are all embedded in the Great Pyramid. They, inside the King's Chamber, which also has all these granite blocks that don't even come from anywhere around the region, that the, the closest is like hundreds of thousands of miles away, and each one of those weigh hundreds of thousands of tons, and they were just quarried from somewhere else, which are perfectly smoothly carved that you can only do with lasers. And then the, the um, what do you call it, the sarcophagus that was inside of it uh, was built into it, never brought in, and again, is made from rose quartz, which does not even, ha not around that area, again, per cut perfectly, and it's arguably that it never had a top to it. It was an open sarcophagus. Now, what they like there's only a few people that talked about this is when they looked at all the different blocks inside of there which primarily most of them were rose quartz but uh, rose granite excuse me and looked at the blocks that they realized that it was like a mapping out of our fucking uh, our solar system and that each one of them had perfect proportions of every planet in our solar system in the blocks that if you take now, this is called the Pyramid Timeline. This is why the Great Pyramid, I think, is one of the greatest relics to show us that not only will we advance, but we may have been contacted by extraterrestrials that helped us build this thing, and it represented something more, something out of time, something that was a technology that um, you go through all the secret passages and shit like that, which, fuck that guy that watches over that Zahi Iwas or whatever he is. He's fucking paid off by a whole bunch of people, and he's the worst archaeologist ever. Um, but like that you follow all of these little things and there's a language to it that every time that a pathway goes up and right, it represents positive, right? Up means evolution, down means de evolution. And so if you take those two major like pathways that go out kind of the sides, they once they line up with two specific stars, one was our North Star and one was another star, a Sirius and Polaris, that was it. Those line up, right? And as soon as that lines up and as soon as Orion's belt lines over, which perfectly lines up with all three pyramids, you start counting time from then. And when you start counting time from the, bo like from the bottom up, it actually shows like every time it moves up and to the right in, and you follow it in inches, Egyptian inches that are history representing each year, that you have some sort of positive movement perfect right on the time in consciousness when it moves down into the left usually it's like a dark age or something like that perfect right on the fucking nose and it just like goes throughout time all the way up until 2012 and so there's this pyramid timeline that shows even accounts for multiple probability possibilities like we were talking about in certain node points really pointed out one of the major ones was uh 1941 and 1942 when we had our war it actually split into two different things one going down to something what they call the pit and the other one ascending and the one that was called the pit went down and then that split into multiple things and was really convoluted and then it had an ending that ended in 2020 in 2020 everything just stopped the other ones moved up and moved up to 2012, the ascending passage. And when it hit 2012, it changed and had three blocked things, which this is where the guy lost it. But 
it like tightened up and represented like time changing, right? Accelerating, if you will. And then represented like, again, you go to the masonry, what did they all represent? The, the third eye on the pyramid, they represent ascension, right? And so you have this like ascended thing that might be happening that we've even, again, a lot of people, there's something called the shamanic resonance that is kind of the earth's heartbeat and what it vibrates at, right? And we arguably like kind of base time or a perception of time based upon that vib vibratory constant. And that's kind of what I believe through understanding like physics and things. I believe that we only perceive time based upon how we spin through time and space. Remember, you move through time, you move through space. So by the, the collective like understanding of the speed of our Earth spinning, that's our perception of time. Let's say you lived on another planet that spun because faster. Because of gravity, yeah. warping space time. Yeah, and so like they may experience a <coughs> hundred years like who's spinning faster in the when we experience 20, right? Because time's completely subjective. And so, like, let's say that if life existed on Earth, like, or a planet that was spinning really quick, they would experience whole lifetimes and the fact that we just experience, like, nothing. You know, something spinning slower may even be slower. But we're only experiencing it based upon our rotation through space. And so, the vibration has a lot to do with that, too. Uh, that... That shamanic, shamanic resonance has changed since 2012 by almost half. That that whole vibration of Earth has changed. That like if you look on Google and look at the common shamanic resonance of the Earth, which is actually a scientifically measurable thing, it's just looked at in the esoteric community, that that has changed by such an exponential amount, and that's between 19, uh, like 1998 and now. And that for some reason the earth is shifting its vibration to something else that this is scientific just ignored by everybody because they don't want to panic people but I, I see the the beneficial things to this too you know and you, you have to admit that the earth will get full of people and shit will rise and then it's wiped clean it happens over and over again and we can't ignore that you know we can't ignore the fact that we reach a certain point and we have to start over again and it's just happened over and over and that we're going to be reaching one of those times again but I think that this time is more important and all the cultures were trying to tell us this all the cultures were trying to be like it's not going to be this rise of consciousness and death and consciousness and death it's going to be more so of a shifting and what just so happens to be and this is why they're taught really pitching um, climate change is because of this fact that a whole bunch of people, and I love this, there's an article called uh, Planetary Day After Tomorrow written by David Wilcock and Richard Hoagland, and they wanted to show how that all the planets are heating up, not just us. That, like, they showed that, like, Pluto, which only, like, hardly gets any sun, and they say that all the heat and everything is generated by our sun, so everything should be heat up or cool down dependent upon the sun's size and the condition that it's in which we've, we, we've always observed. Pluto is he, heated, heated up over a thousand percent, even on the dark side, that all these planets are showing uh, like a hundred times heating up, thousand times heating up, shit's melting on certain things that have ice caps, things like that. All of the planets show massive heating up and radiation increases. What would be causing that? The sun. Okay. Now, the sun is going through solar minimums and maximums, which we always see. But what they don't talk about is that we move through, our galaxy is moving like our arm is moving, right? And making a full rotation, which is in a specific amount of years, which we understand how much that is as well. But it spins like this. And that everything, because of what we perceive as gravity or things moving into itself, is kind of doing this. And this is what we're doing. We're kind of doing this. So we're moving further towards the center as we move on, right? So we're doing this and doing this, but each turn that we do in our locality, which this is such a broad spectrum, because there's all little lo local things that we're going through, that there are these energy clouds that are gas clouds that are superheated and things like that. And we have to move through those. And this is ar arguably about density, right? Now, let's look at vibration, right? That these clouds vibrate at like there isn't even a number that I can understand how much hotter 
like I've looked at it and it's like I don't even know. I, I can't even remember because it's so unfathomable that we can't even measure. None of our planets, even at the hottest, which is way beyond some of them, like Venus, the, how hot that gets or how hot the sun gets, it's hotter. So, like, and the particles move so incredibly faster that they actually are almost like a wall hitting them because they move so much faster. So it's such a high vibratory hot cloud that we've been moving into ever so slowly our whole uh, solar system since the 1980s. The Russians discovered it. NASA discovered it. Like everybody discovered it. And like the Russians wrote about it extensively that you can read about, but everybody shut up about it after that. Because what does that suggest? That suggests that if we move into it, it's going to cause our whole galaxy to heat up. We're going to be exposed to a lot more radiation. Our sun will be the first one to react. Our sun will get a big boost of energy, which would either cause it to expand or flash. Which, what would that cause? That Global would, extinction. Yeah. So, to look at this, or maybe something else, if we don't understand consciousness, because we our whole consciousness is based upon the sun, all life. We just think about the physical reaction. Because, like, our sun has caused us to evolve. Now, if the sun was to rapidly change... Maybe the human DNA was to rapidly change, you know? And so a lot of these crop circles, a lot of these cultures are saying that we're coming f into a change. And, like, a lot of them represent this, like, one degree thing. And what just so happens to be one degree from 2000, like, you think about it, like, one degree would be, like, a hundred years, at least a hundred years movement. And so over the next hundred years that we would have rapid changes in our own DNA, right? And what we're seeing is that we are having it. And that's what we're seeing a lot in this junk DNA. Now this is the real weird thing, is that we really look at like 100 years before our DNA to our DNA now. And it's changed so much that we've never seen that change ever before in history. That we're moving through this rapid change, but because of society, we just don't see it. That we're actually evolving really quickly. The only thing that's holding us back from evolving even more is all of the poison, all of the everything. It's like they're deliberately trying to stop us from evolving because we're rapidly evolving. Something's happening. And we've seen this before in history. And that's what they want you to ignore, is that there's these massive jumps in a specific, like I said, geometric time frame. Somebody who addresses this quite aggressively, somebody who addresses this quite aggressively is David Wilcock in the book The Source Field Investigations. Now his conclusion at the end of the book because he wrote this before 2012. He was just following the evidence. Is it something that's going to happen around 2012? He was on that big you know, thing about, oh, other things are going to happen. <laughs> but it, uh, the universe is bigger. It doesn't work that way. Like Something that's like would be a jump in the universe would be hundreds and thousands of years, but it still could be a jump in the whole large spectrum. And so that's what he understands that he's seeing now. But he talked about this and showed like one of the few people that actually mapped out all these energy densities in our whole entire thing and how they're geometrically perfect and how every planet moves through them and that that's what it is. It's just upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. And that we've seen it in the fossils that all of a sudden like everything's just like, oh, there's just like life and it's not going anywhere. And boom, plants. And then all the da -da 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 -da, boom, animals. And this just doesn't gradually move up. They just fucking bam, bam, bam in these perfect uh, geometric intervals and uh, that we may be coming to one of those as well. So even though it's a scary thing to think about that we're moving into this, which is scientifically proven, you have to look at it in the way that even though that's a physical representation of the change, and we're already feeling the effects from it. We're already getting waves, which is causing the, the sun to have more solar flares. We're already getting the earth is like having more earthquakes and these are bigger than ever and things like that. And I mean, it's caused by little macro things, which would be like our sun and just like other shit. But like what's causing the sun to react as well is that. And so that's what they don't want to tell you is because people would really change their perspective if they knew our sun was being influenced by a large energy cloud that we're moving into. And there's so much more to our universe than what we even understand. And that we've knew about this for a while, but we just didn't want the public to react because there's lots of doomsday sayers. But, I mean, like, even recorded on NASA. So, like, let's talk about this. Now, because of that, we're having lots more solar flares. Now, if the Earth passed by when one of those massive solar flares is like 10 times the size of the Earth actually was directed at us, it would literally fry us. So there's that chance. It always could just happen now. 
What stops that, right? Now, the interesting thing... What stops a uh, solar flare? Yeah, is what stops that, especially in a solar maximum, which we're experiencing. So, like, we were... Like, everybody has their fucking cameras pointed on the sun now. You can't really hide many things from people because NASA's the b- biggest expert of airbrushing and hiding things and everything. But with all these live streams, things really slip through the cracks easily. And, you know, they don't pay those motherfucking employees enough to hide everything. You know, and there's too many levels of secrecy for everyone to know what the fuck's going on. So that's where it's problematic. And when the the thing that they recorded, which this was, I just thought this was so badass awesome because it gives me hope upon like how we would get through something like this. Because I'm, I'm t- I'll tell you what, that we're held back so much, we're not where we're supposed to be. We are like, if if there's many like other life and observing us the reason that they do not deal with us is because we're fucking violent. We're like the children, we're like the retarded children of the galaxy that have big weapons that could harm things. And things that have evolved past war, we're aiming missiles at everything. We have enough nuclear warheads to blow up our Earth 50 times. We would cause such a massive thing if we blew up all the bombs on our Earth, we would literally decimate literally our whole entire solar system. That's how much weaponry we have. That's how dangerous nuclear weaponry is we literally have enough to fuck our whole entire solar system so if i was advanced i would tread lightly as well because you know what are our first reaction aliens ah, shoot them you know and so like what you see and what they've observed and several people recorded this is that there was some solar flares that were getting close to us and like one of the solar flares went out but instead of it doing its normal thing, and this wasn't even one that was like, we're here, this is where it is, but there was something that it went around, and it was like a large cylindrical thing that was five times the size of Earth. It was black because it went around it. It was being cloaked or something, but like multiple people recorded this, and they said that there were these black spheres around the sun, and like a lot of people were criticized, but they're like, we were just filming. This is recorded, streamed shit. You can't, we don't believe in any of the shit. We don't know what these are. And so there's these black spheres that seem to be blocking something that you cannot see. Like, light bends around them. And, like, nobody has an explanation for that. And it was heading towards Earth. Well, I mean, that, was, that one was closer. It's just that we noticed it in watching the solar flares. So it seems that there's something actively blocking anything that seems to be close to us, as even to give us more time. And again, because I can't... I can only speculate what that was. It was either something that was parked by there or something or one of those, like, I mean, there's so many theoretical things. It could be, like, one of those dark matter. Mm. You know, whatever. But whatever it was, was, like, five times the size of Earth, perfectly cylindrical, and it moved around it. That's the only reason it was even visible is because the it had to move around it. And, like, stuff like that happens all the time and that's stuff that's like not like when multiple people film it that don't even know like one in Australia one in this and one in that and everybody filmed it why why would people and half of these people are either atheist or don't believe in this or don't believe in that and they have no agendas they have no nothing but you review it you know have you seen the videos yeah yeah I find it really interesting because like it was talked about a lot in uh, a lot of fields that people that said that they uh, actually had contacts and like said that what what was going on and things like that because you have to take that with like fucking a stride because I don't believe I believe some people just want attention and then I believe that some people may uh, may actually have contacts because there's been a lot of like fucking one of the weirdest things like I love this one because this excites me because I really enjoy um, like ufology and things uh, there's a guy named W.B. Smith right okay as soon as the nuclear warhead was invented, that that's when all the UFO sightings started to come in, right? Is that there was UFO sightings before, but we do the Manhattan Project, and then all of a sudden there's this big explosion of UFO sightings. They correlated with that. And then they were so aggressive, and there were so many things that they were trying to cover up, which was openly documented, that Canada had a guy that they wanted to send down to investigate to see if this was real and what what the thing is because there's just too much hoopla about it. And his name is W.B. Smith. Now, this was around the time of tw- uh, President D. Eisenhower. And 
W.B. Smith went down and he like he used a lot of pseudonyms for himself because he was trying to do this kind of covertly and he was going coming into America to investigate. Now, um, he now this is really interesting that there were a whole bunch of people because a lot of people were communicating through Morse code at the time that said that they were getting signals on Morse code on their little machines because some people had that in their house that uh, were saying that they were from a di- there were people who were trying to contact them they thought it was a joke from a different place and that they needed to talk to somebody or whatever and they were telling them all these different things some people believed it some people didn't well he was like I'm not sure about this and so he went to a couple of these places and saw this and these things whatever they were started to communicate a lot of stuff and he said well I'm not sure if you're legit and then he's like well uh, I know a lot of top secret things because of my clearance and he asked some specific questions and they answered those questions and knew exactly what it was and he's like, well, this is weird. And so then uh, that he did that in several locations because it, it was spread out. Like there's many people across many states that said that they were getting these contacts. And then all of a sudden that half of them that said that they were getting the contacts said that they started to hear things in their head and that it moved to like a telepathic contact. And so then he was skeptical and he went around to each one of these things in different states and he made this whole like questionnaire because he wanted to like route out the people that were genuine and the people that weren't or if they were even lying and he put a whole bunch of stuff that was absolutely top secret that no one knew about but hit people in his clearance and these were farmers and people that just didn't know shit and half of them weren't even did it, like dropped out of high school and things and so he gave this thing and he said like a large percentage of them answered all of the questions correctly and then gave like things like he even asked questions that he fully didn't even understand because he wanted to trick people and they answered those correctly and so then there was some that just completely were just like i just want attention you know but what ended up happening is these all these people they said that they were first in morse code and then it moved to uh, like more of a telepathic contact and then they described like there was a whole thing that he wrote about about like he started talking to these people who is this uh wb smith now that when you Google that on Wikipedia, it's just going to say who he is. But a lot of his work that was done, um, fuck, I wish I could know where to send you to to find this because, like, David Wilcock and his, uh, like, his investigations, he got a hold of all those government things and he has a lot of all that stuff. And then there was a book that was written under one of his pseudonyms, and I wish I could remember what that book was about this whole thing, right? And the interesting part was, is, like, <laughs> There's another person that I like. There was a, another investigator around that time, a little bit past in the 1970s, named Don Elkins, and he was uh, he was a physicist that was also a teacher, and he used all of his money to study UFOs and the paranormal just for his own jollies. And he was also a pilot. He was a genius, and so he found all this amazing stuff. And when they were passing around those flyers, and he actually got one, he got one of those things to vet people out, and he gave it to a girl named Carla Rokert, which David Wilcock then stayed with for a long time. And so he got one of the original copies of those questionnaires and has all those things on it. So, like, that's a really cool kind of random rare thing is that, like, he's one of the few ones that actually has an existing copy of that. And then, like, the guy wrote about it in his book, and there's a whole bunch of other things. Now, the interesting thing here is what he reported and what he reported back to the Canadian government because these things said that they at this current time were allowed to break this is interesting to break the treaty of containment or break the treaty of quarantine that we were under and he said they said that they were solely positive and have our interest in mind it's just that we have remembered and this is how they put it, that we have remembered a technology in our time span or in our, they, I mean, they really referred to us as in this time, uh, what would they say, like this time note or time whatever, and they said that we don't fully understand what time is, but we weren't supposed to discover that until way later in our evolution. And we discovered that because of the remembering of certain entities that were advanced, and they said that 
it could be dangerous to our future that we discover this. And they said that they are of positive, like whatever, so they respect the law of free will and that they would not land or come into our atmosphere until we solely, as a whole, agreed upon letting them do so. They said if it would make fear or have a fear response that they would not do it because it would hinder our evolution. And they said so we all had to agree or primarily the leaders would have to disclose to us that they were going to do so and we would have to be okay with it for them to be able to do so. And then like he kept on asking them questions and he said that like throughout the whole his report he said that he used to be a Christian and he said after talking to them that he completely like dropped Christianity that he said the concepts and the things that they told him about galaxies and the whole thing were just amazingly full of love and beyond comprehension and he said that actually made him better as a person and he said it was beautiful and he said like he turned in his stuff to the Canadian government and they said, like, when he talked to them, he said that they were going to be visiting, and this is really interesting because this is where the conspiracies, like, even apart from him, say that, remember the Majestic 12 or all the things about that, about how extraterrestrials met with Eisenhower and a whole bunch of other people. That's right before he resigned. And that's when, like, uh, the UFOs kind of went away for a little bit. It coincides because they said that they were going to meet with some of our the Americans' officials for that very purpose. And it was around that same time. But yeah, the things that they told him, and they even told him about things that now we're finding out to be true, is like, you know, the Bermuda Triangle and stuff like that. They explained that we didn't understand how, like, the universe worked. And there are these, like, rivers of energy that they use to travel along that we don't see or understand. And that there are these node points, right, that energy comes through. Now, they said what it does is, like, if anything was passing through that zone, it makes all matter, like, liquid. And then when you fly out of it, it hardens it back up. So they said if a plane was to fly through that, it would literally make it the plane, like, soft and malleable for a second and reharden, which would tear the plane apart. And he's, they said that that's what's happening to a lot of things and people don't understand. They fly into these vortex zones or whatever you want to call them and that they, they tear planes apart and planes disappear. And they say that we know this quite, you know, because they know how this works and they have things that measure that and they stay away from them. They said because even we don't know where they appear all the time because they're random and they move. And he said they described the technology that we could make so that we could understand that because they were talking about like there was a couple like things or jets that went after uh, a UFO from Canada that were part of their military and everything like that and they disappeared. And they said, well, why did you do that? That was one of his questions. It's like, well, why would, if you're solely positive, why would you make these people disappear? Do you know what they are? And they said it wasn't our fault. We were trying to help them avoid it. And we knew where it was, but they flew right into it regardless, and it tore them apart. And they said that we can help you out with the technology that you can make that can do that. And they described how you can make it out of a pen. So how did he get, how did he get contact with these people? Um, that he was just investigating, uh, like, reports. He was investigating reports, and a lot of people were saying that they were getting contact because it happened all across the United States all at once. And so he investigated this, and, like, that's when he made those little things. So he was talking to extraterrestrial, yeah, he like, was through, through you know, other people as almost like... Yeah, like a telepathic contact. At first, it seemed to be from the reports uh, through Morse code, and then it moved into more telepathic. And then that what's interesting is like my own personal studies on the ones that are more legit. This is a like a thing that people that said that they had contacts and actually like had information that they shouldn't have or things like that always tend to say that like they like anything that contacted them never really talked to them. They, they just knew it was like it was in their head. And, yeah, it seems that a lot of these other things that seem to be like it, it always coincides is like this telepathic contact and most of them say that like most of them say that they don't even have vocal cords that some of them just make noises just to like you know like we put periods on of our, on our sentences because they have the image that they send to you and then they like to, to define it further may make a noise to like you know how we kind of have inflection and yeah it's really interesting stuff um, I mean 
all of this aside, because you're talking about like people investigations, because I've really gotten deep into this, I really find like something that I find interesting is through hypnosis. Okay, when you're under hypnosis, you can, you can, like find out the deepest darkest secrets about people and they can't hide it from you because you're you're going through like that recorded part of your life now um there was this guy um named michael newton right that wrote this book called journey of souls now what made him so unique is he was a very astute and recognized hypnotist they just did normal hypnotism to help people, which he helped a lot of people get over habits, become more successful, do all the normal things, right? He had a lot of friends that did past life regression, right? And he didn't know if he believed in that kind of stuff, right? But like a lot of people... I'm his very p- open to the idea of past life regressions. I've yeah. seen some like live documented uh, videos on YouTube mm-hmm. and... It's very convincing, I'll yeah, say that much. Exactly. And now now here's the interesting part is that because I believe it, I actually through my own investigations, the one of the oh, what was his name? Because uh, Ian McClellan. Ian McClellan, I think it's Ian McClellan or Ian something. He did the most extensive research on past life regression, did over thirty thousand cases. Oh. And, yeah, like, so like he's the he is the mother or the father of I'm all that putting stuff. Putting that name down yeah. too. Like uh, I'll double check on that. Because, like, I know it's Ian something, and I think it's McClellan, um, but you'll find it right away. You'll know, because he has over 30,000 cases uh, that he's documented. And then everybody kind of else, like, in the modern world, uh, like, bases their work upon him. Because he put in all the fucking, you know, he went around the world. He went to the UK. He went to the <laughs> everything like that. And the, the fucking shit's amazing. Like, you know, a five-year-old child, like, uh, well, one of the cases that just blew my mind was a very young child s- was saying that they were murdered, right? Said that they were a specific name, said the location that they used to live, they were murdered, and they felt like they were very wronged. And so he initially checked into this name and checked into its location, found a guy who was murdered by that name in that location. The kid described the house that he lived in, everything like that, and it was even in, I think it was in like another uh, country. And so <coughs> he gets the kid, takes him to the place, and he says, like, I know the person who murdered. They go, they confront that motherfucking guy, and the guy breaks down in tears and confesses to the motherfucking murder. Like, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. And this kid remembered it. And then after that happened and everything like that, as the kid grew up, he forgot all about it. Like, it talked to about later, he's like, I, I don't remember. And so that's what happens to a lot of children is once they get past that, like, malleable, like I said, that age, for they solidify, life gets in, they forget. And, yeah, then they're just like, yeah, I don't know. Like, there's a lot of kids that were talking about, like, the positions of galaxies and talking about planets and knew all this stuff that they couldn't possibly know. And, like, there was so many interesting things. But so, like, I've always been convinced of that through my own studies, through there's studies of Edgar Casey. Um, uh, studies of lots of people. Do you know anything about Edgar Casey? No. He was the most recorded. Uh, I'll add his name too. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, if you want a really great book about him, um, it's called *The American Prophet* by Sidney Kirkpatrick, and it's all about the life of Edgar Casey. It is a Christian slant to it. Has a Christian slant, with which you need to kind of like put aside. But if you put aside and actually look at the whole thing, is he was the most recorded psychic seer of all time that m- people couldn't prove wrong. He healed over 15,000 people. Um, they called him the sleeping prophet is because in a waking state, he was a normal person. He kind of had some psychic abilities, but it was just nothing beyond, you know, like whatever. And he was a Christian. He was a devout Christian, so he was scared of all these abilities. He was like, oh, they might become the devil, you know, whatever. But when they put him to sleep or they put him under a hi- hypnotic trance, that he could, all they'd have to do is tell him the name of the person and where they were located. And he'd be silent. And he'd say, the entity of blah, blah, blah is located. Proceed with questioning. And then they would ask, what are the physical ailments that have to do with this person? And he would scan their whole entire body and break down everything that was wrong with them, everything that da 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 Like, and it's happened over and over again. And he'd give them a, di- like a diagnosis, and then it'd be like, do you want to have a diagnosis and cure for this entity and they'd be like yes what is the what is the cure for this and he would tell them a whole protocol of what to go through to heal from their shit 
and like all the people that followed the protocol would get better. And like there was a doctor that even joined up with him named Dr. Ketchum because he's like, wow, you do this. See, I can write the prescriptions. You just diagnose them. And so they made this kind of like psychic doctor thing. And like they jailed them several times because of what they were doing and everything like that. And then like he was got so popularized or famous, even though they weren't making hardly any money. And he was always poor as fuck that like scientists from all over heard about him and they're like we're gonna prove this motherfucker wrong and they did all these things and like one of the funniest fucking things that they had two doctors that uh diagnosed this one patient and they knew and they wrote their diagnosis in the morning on a piece of paper and put it in their pockets and they both didn't communicate with each other they came in that day and then they had casey do a reading on him and he read the whole thing broke down the whole body and then they're like ha i diagnosed this and the other one's like, yeah, I diagnosed that. And then he made them both look like fools because he said that, yes, your observation is astute and da-da-da-da-da, but you did not check for the rash that was in between these two toes, which indicates blah, 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 blah. And they look over, and there's a rash in between the toes. And they're like, uh, and then fucking they were like, oh, my God, he's right. And they got flustered. Just by putting himself in hypnot or being put in hypnotic, hypnotic state. state. Yeah. And so, like, did he, he even look at these people himself? N- never. No, what well, I mean, fuck? well, the thing was, is he didn't beforehand, but like, you know, sometimes people came to him and they, they did that thing. Like he was, he literally was raised on a farm. He literally didn't do anything. He even could sleep on books and absorb them. He, that was like, it was really weird because like he told a story about like what happened that he had communication. Again, his perception was they were angels that were talking to them, talking to him. But again, strive. Remember belief systems shape things. So if something, if something comes to you and again, like again, through many of these things that I've studied, the things that I do think are legit higher beings explain that they don't, that are positive. They don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. They don't want to scare human beings. So like whatever your belief system is, they will appear to you as such that they will like kind of take you the shape of what you're perceiving them as. Like, so some people, their beliefs are angels. Some people will be like aliens. Some people will believe this and that. And the other thing that maybe the grandfather or whatever is just that they do this to make us feel comfortable. Some kind of sense of entity. Yeah, exactly. Or the mind does it. Yeah, or the mind or the mind shapes it. And that's what they were saying about how mind shapes, mind translates. And they said that you know, they're taking you're taking something that's formless and that has an idea behind it and your mind is making it into what it is. So and like well he said that uh, there was this which his dad can concur that his dad was really a hard ass and like Casey was always like at in school he was always daydreaming and things like that because he just couldn't focus in school. And he was kind of a, uh, his father was kind of a very political entity, very respected by the town. He's like, I'm not going to have a stupid child. And so he sent him down and he tutored him. And he's like, what's on this page? And da, 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 da. He's been really hard on him. And in case he was exhausted, he was falling asleep. And his father got frustrated. And like every time that he wouldn't like get something right, he'd smack him off of his chair. He'd get back up and he'd try to do it and smack him off of his chair. And... He's like, can I just take a break? And he's like, okay. And so he went into the other room, made some coffee, and he said that he heard this voice say, Casey, sleep. Sleep, and the answers will be there. Sleep. And so he fell asleep. He fell asleep on the book. And uh, then, like, his father saw that he fell asleep, and he fucking shook him off of there and, like, threw him on the floor. And then... He said that Casey was excited. He's like, oh, my God. He's like, ask me about it. Ask me about it. I know it. I know it. He's like, what? And he's like, this. And he, like, recited the whole entire page to him. He's like, what? And he flipped and went like this. He's like, oh, this page. And, like, he told him everything that was on the page, all the captions, all the things, all the pictures and everything like that. And, like, he got angry because he thought he couldn't explain it any other way than, like, he already knew the book and he was playing a trick on him. So he hit him, you know. And... Like, that's what ended up happening from that day on, is he could put a book underneath his pillow, and he would absorb everything in the book. And so, of course, later on in his life, he started to work at a bookstore, because he, like, then they were impressed, because he knew all the knowledge of all the books, because any book that he slept on, he could, like, 
retain all the knowledge. So that was one of the amazing things that he could do that was recorded by his family, recorded by friends and everything. That's like that. unreal. Un- That's unreal. Absolutely, absolutely unreal. unreal. And see, what makes this so cool is he was the most recorded. What I mean recorded is he was trying to be, like prove wrong by people that worked at universities, doctors, everything like that, and scared the fuck out of him because he, his diagnoses were always right. He even did things and like, okay, going back to those two doctors, and this was so fucking funny is that they, they had the diagnosis in their pockets, and they're like, oh, and he showed them up. And they had to look up words that he was using because they couldn't, like, it was beyond their medical understanding, and they found out that there was an actual diagnosis. And, like, so then they're, they got frustrated, and there was a mail carrier that was coming in, and they just didn't believe it. And so they grabbed the mail carrier, and they're like, what's in this package? And he's like, candles. And they pull it out, and there's candles... And then the mail carrier was frightened. He dropped all of his mail and ran out the door. Yeah, because it was like completely sealed. They didn't know what was in the package and he opened it up and it was like two candles exactly how he described. And he said some other random arbitrary object, but both of those objects were in there that none of them knew were in there and scared the fuck out of the guy and the guy ran out of the room. And like then like so many other things and this is such a cool thing. Like this is my first getting into like uh, hypnosis in the psychic realm and things and it's one of the most awesome stories is because there was so much recorded data on it. And like even Houdini went to go see the guy because he was he was a magician. And he believed in none of it. Anything esoteric, he believed it was a movement, a trend, that people were trying to swindle people, and he always proved everybody wrong. He had a record of proving everybody wrong, so they were charlatans and everything like that because he knew how to do it. He knew exactly what they were doing, and he went to go see him. And when they interviewed him. To prove him wrong. Yeah, to prove him wrong. And when they interviewed him, he had no comment. He couldn't prove him wrong. And he's one of the few that he could not prove wrong. What's this guy's name again? Is a- Edgar Casey, C A Y C E. Edgar Casey, holy shit. Yeah. And just like so many people wrote about him, but not many people had a, a, like extensive access to all when of his he readings. Alive? Uh, early 1900s, died in 1945. Wow. Yeah. And so, like, he, like, a lot of all, he was the father of actually nutrition, the actual nutrition. And the father of like the whole esoteric movement, besides uh, Madame Blavatsky, which she was more so they call her that, but she had like Luciferian undertones. I don't like anything by her, because there's a whole bunch of think- things that I think are false from her. But a lot of people follow it. That's what they teach up at the school of metaphysics too. They base a lot of their shit upon. That's why I never would go there, is because I think a lot of it is distorted. And again, you get that. I think she was right about some stuff, but very little bit. Like I said, I'm shocked that that whole school really puts her on a pedestal. And like, ah, I haven't looked into it. I'm just like, it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, but yeah, this is crazy. Like I even, like a lot of the lessons that I will apply is like he, uh, like whatever his source was when they said, because they wanted to know what they were getting into. And he explained it as a source and that his source was more so of his higher self. Right, and his higher self, he said, because of the abilities of this entity and its brain structure was able to access something what he called the Akashic Records. He said, which is a record of all things ever experienced throughout time. And he said it was like reading a book. And he said, so when that they said the name and the location of the person, that he could locate, locate their space time and where they were located and how their current condition was. And he said that that's how he did that. And... Uh, when like different like explanations again when he even talked about how a human being filters that kind of communication and things like that and that their biases and everything like that that like what's coming out of them they're the filter for it even if th- they said that uh, the reason the case he had to be unconscious is to lessen that filter to make the communication mu- more pure and that's why there was able to be less distortion but they say that people that consciously channel things have a lot of distortion because their biases play in, their ego plays in, everything like that plays into it, that they may be getting a communication, but they're distorting it through their own consciousness. That for someone to get more of a pure communication, would they would have to be subjugated from that. And there's only very few, and I'm very particular about this, 
uh, when it comes to contacts because some people like channel it and you, you do. You see a lot of the ego in and I'm not even sure I could weigh that back and forth if they're actually getting a contact or channeling something higher. But the ones that channeled the stuff that is fucking just like amazingly true and I can't say anything because of the language. You can, s- you can hear it. You can hear how it comes through that it's way beyond its time that nobody even touches on this. It's very like straightforward. It's like they're using only the words that would be the perfect thing to describe that was Edgar Casey and the raw material, which is the raw readings and again. And this girl was rendered completely unconscious to do this. And see, so those were like two of the few cases besides Seth Speaks. And that I've recommended everybody read that book because I do believe that that was a contact. And I believe that that was just fucking just it's ridiculous. It was in the 19, like either 1940s or 1960s. And dude, like he talked about what we come to in quantum physics then. Like, nobody understood that. He d- 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 describes multi-dimensions, the geometry of the universe, everything like that, how that works, how everything, just like everything came through in such a co- concise whatever fashion. And, like, it, l- it rings true today in, like, 2019. And so, like, that's one of those that's awesome. Um, but, yeah, so he's doing this and, like, then, like, healing all these people and all these people trying to, like, prove them wrong. Nobody can prove them wrong. Um some other scientists came down to study him from, I think, Cambridge University or something like that. He was either Cambridge or Oxford. And they were all more so on the thing to not prove him wrong, but see what they could do. And, like, so when he was under, they wanted to ask him a couple questions and things about that, about medical, whatever. And he said, since you came down, like, since since you removed yourselves from the academia, like, spoke so, like, perfect. I'm trying to remember that... You have come here to learn. And so a lesson will be taught. And then he said, lesson one, mind is the builder, physical is the result. And then he went through how the mind is the creator and that this is like malleable. And that by what we think in our belief system shape our reality. And so, you know, he took notes on this. And he said, for example, you have a nephew. And they're like, yeah. And they're like, he works around here. They said, that, do you know his current you know, daily routine. He's like, a matter of fact, I do. He does the same daily routine every day. And they're like, he, he was like, tell him, everybody in his routine that he sees, that to suggest that he's getting sick. And that by the end of his rounds, that he will develop a sickness. And so he went to, it like, the first thing, he went to somewhere where he ate in a diner, and they're like, oh, you're looking a little peaked, you know, whatever. And then he went to the pharmacy, which he always usually goes to, and they're like, you feeling okay? And he's like, each time, he was like, oh, yeah, well, I, I mean, I feel okay. And next time, he's like, oh, yeah, uh, I guess I'm kind of feeling a little weird. And by the third and the fourth, he's like, oh, man, I'm not feeling too good. And then by the time that he was done with his rounds, he had the flu. All by the suggestion placebo uh, yeah but placebo, the mind manifested that the mind manifested a real problem that wasn't existent in the first place and that's what he was that's what he wanted to show them that mind is the builder and physical is the result what the fuck and he was the first one to ever teach that and you see how that's coming back to that now and that was in the 1930s and he was telling people that like f- through that lesson and that's one of my favorite lessons because like what they did is because at first it was just medical and then more started to come out dependent upon the questionnaire. And that's what they said is they said that the questionnaire determined what information came out because of the law of free will. And they said if someone wasn't ready to hear something, that th- if nothing would come out, just depended upon their own understanding. So if you had a questionnaire that's very open-minded and actually had a lot of understanding that the, the more information would be allowed to come through because it was only based upon their own physical evolution or their own mental and you know, spiritual evolution. And so when they got really good questionnaires, a lot of good stuff came through. And he started to teach lessons in those states about like where he could read people and like talking about past lives. This is where this was like, and see like what's really funny to show you how legit this was, Casey didn't believe in past life re- regression or past life anything. But in one of the readings where it first came through, it said that, one of the people he was trying to heal because he had something wrong with his legs and something wrong with his heart. And it said that this person, this because they were going to diagnose him, and because he wasn't aware of what he said when he was under that state, they had to write it all down and then show him. Or even, like, you know, whatever. So, like, he would then read him afterwards and be like, oh, wow. You know, because he didn't know any of this shit. Like, and then 
one of them, he's like, oh, this entity has these leg problems and the heart problems because of the, the pain and woe that he relives all the time from his death in the last war and described how he died. And he was like, his legs were like, he had gangrene in his legs and then he was stabbed in the heart and that like, that it was a like combination of those two things that he's reliving and he's just re-manifesting that in current time that he has to let go of that fear and that pain for him to stop manifesting those things in those things like and they were like what and like he didn't believe in it and then multiple things started to come out about people that had physical woes based upon their past life past life expressions it took him years to believe that and that shows you like what in the world was happening there? And when he did treat, when they told these people this and treated them as that, they got better. And so, like, it really gets interesting. This whole story gets so amazing is that then he started to do readings for people. Like, the reading of all the experience of that person, past and front, like, you know, forward and everything like that, about, like, what would be most beneficial for that thing. And it would, he would go through the tendencies, the past experiences, all those things, and called them life readings, and did those for people. And did a lot of, like, past life regression. Then a lot of people came down and actually asked him questions about existence because they didn't have any reservations about believing him. They wanted to, you know, contact that source and find out about history and things. And he did a whole bunch of stuff on the life of Jesus Christ, did a whole thing about that, did a whole thing about Atlantis and the past the things of that, uh, our past cultures and civilizations and like how we've been advanced before and things like that. Uh, the beginning of uh, the world, all things like that underneath that state. And so they asked him a lot of interesting questions. Again, a lot of these people that were asking the questions had Christian backgrounds and things. And so again, it slants it. But the information that comes through is amazing and really like plugs into history. And now we find out like years later, he was telling the truth. Like, most of his shit's verifiable. He even said that the, the Atlanteans existed and that the, they sunk and the whole world, you know, but most of them escaped to what he said, Egypt. And he said that's why you see a lot of advanced things in Egypt and that there was, uh, like, a lot of governments tried to repress that un understanding and knowledge. But there's a whole, he said that there was a whole bunch of tributaries underneath the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. Now, remember, this is in the 1930s, 40s he's saying this. And that the Hall of Records, what he called them, that where the Atlanteans stored their knowledge because they wanted to, the little ones that were left from that whole catastrophe wanted to store all their understandings because they were way more advanced than all the other cultures. And so they were kind of alienated because they knew how to do stuff that everybody else didn't know how to do. And so they wanted to store their lineage underneath. And they said they, he had, they stored it underneath. One of the major compartments was under the right, s right foot of the Sphinx, Right. Well, it's very strict around the Great Pyramid. They don't let you do anything, like they're hiding something almost. Well, one of the people from uh, the Association, Association of ARE, um, which is Association of Research and Enlightenment, was able to like somehow finagle the government to where he could get some radar to where he could look underneath because he wanted to see if that was real. And like in the like 2000s, guess what he found underneath the right foot of the Sphinx? He found a compartment that was hollow and there was something in the middle of it that was the size of an airplane hanger underneath there. They won't let them dig. They won't let them do that. Now they ban any kind of sonar or anything underneath there. They will not let anybody do anything. But he found that underneath exactly where Casey said. Uh, he said that... Why would they want to oppress that information? Oh, the... Well, okay. The Zah Zahi Iwas, I think that's how you pronounce his name, and, um, okay, most of the people that do Egyptology, right, are run by people in Egypt. So all of the scientific community has to siphon through that for all the knowledge that they hold. There can't be any independent study of Egypt besides what is sanctioned by the government, which is Egyptology. So people that study Egyptology have to go through the school that is deemed by the government is okay, right? So all of the people, or most anyway, that run that place are Muslim and they believe in the um, early Earth theory. Like, you know, the Earth is only like 2,000 and something years old. All of them. So all of what they teach is based upon that. So if you say that this came from an ancient culture that may have been 12,500 or older, nope, sorry. And that... Does this have anything to do with Gobekli Tepe? Oh, yeah, well, Gobekli Tepe 
it's fucking how old was that? Was it like ten thousand years old? Did I they think do? It's about twelve thousand. Yeah, twelve thousand. Yeah, and like we found that like Graham Hancock has done extensive work on this. Is like he shows that pretty much something happened about twelve thousand five hundred years ago that put a lot of ancient cultures underneath the water. That we had advanced cultures. Um, and his smoking gun is the evidence from the like the ice drilling that we did that a comet hit about that time and sent us back. Like I was talking about the second ice age. I get, again, a lot of the information that I get is through his investigations because he was a journalist that was really into a- like academic. He's no conspiracy theorist whatsoever. He just he understands how it works because he used to be a journalist that most of the shit that everybody prints is bullshit. We're just regurgitating stuff and governments have agendas. So like he actually investigates hands on himself like fucking he wrote a book called Underworld to where he went around with the diving team for eight years himself and just by word of mouth went around to all these different cultures and said, hey, is there cities that are sunken that you know about and like any legends? And he did that all by word of mouth and found all these sunken cities that they went and scuba dived and took evidence from eight years. And so like not only did he write about it like all these other people do, but he actually went himself and investigated that, which he did. He found that all of these cities that were sunk were sunk at about the same depth of, like, level, right? And were around the same variance. And that there was so much of a water level rise. And then he calculated water level rise to, like, how much, like, did a lot of math and stuff and realized about how much the water level would have had the rows to sink all these cities. And it seems like one universal event, like, did that. And all of these cities tend to have pure... Like, a couple of them have sphinxes. A couple of them have pyramids. And they're all way, 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 way far away from Egypt. And, like, it seemed like this, there was this universal communication throughout the whole entire world that understood something. And, again, we don't want to rewrite history books. We don't want that because then, oh, God, that would really change everything. That we were super advanced, you know, uh, would destroy religions, you know, and that's the power structure. But that's what it is. And we have. And, like, again, that, uh, I mean, it, I just don't see how a mainstream science can't look at the fact that, oh, Ice Age, Ice Age, Ice Age, many Ice Age, and be like, there was no catastrophe that happened. Well, why was there a mini Ice Age? I'm not even sure what their fucking explanation is because it's so ludicrous that I didn't even, like, p- like pay mind to it because I'm just like, What? You know? Species with amnesia, yeah. as Graham Hancock yeah. says. And so, I mean, that's that's the thing is you have all these things. And like Casey talked about this. That's what he put it at. He put it at 12,000 motherfucking 500 years old before we did that. He just put all the timelines line up. And Gobekli Tepe's, twelve. Within, I mean, within, within the past few of, years, yeah. it's been discovered though, right? Yeah, and that's what he's talking about is like, that's what I really find is so awesome and interesting is because a lot of, those two sources that I kind of quoted, they said a lot of things that were then like discovered in the 1960s and they said in the 1940s and then not now they keep on discovering things that they talked about, you know. And like, I don't think that there's many things. So it was Casey and who else? Uh, Casey and, well, this is going to be your own kind of vibratory constant. Like this is really extreme, uh, I would call it the raw material or the law of one. And when I say that, you know how we were talking about vibration Right. I believe that there are some things that are such from a higher place that they hold a vibratory constant and that only certain people will be attracted to them. They can be put in people's life. And I've seen this like this is weird when you see this because like I found that and I'm just like, wow, you know. And I've told people about it that find it interesting. But again, they somehow get knocked away from it like it doesn't even exist or forget about it. It's like it just fades by them. And it's just like a weird thing because they even said in that fucking writing that that's how it would be, that that it's a higher vibratory thing and that if it doesn't resonate with that person because it's so specific, that they will it'll almost be like they will be directed away from it. And that only s- the w- only the ones that will you know resonate with it can be able to uh, accept this just because of high vibrational constant that it came through. They said because you have not in, the, in this one, they said that you have not communicated with something of this level of consciousness. They said for over like because they had problems with our. They said they exist so much out of time, and they see us throughout all time, always, and it's constantly changing that 
them trying to fit into a time frame is very hard for them because they don't look at time the way we look at time. But they said for our best like estimation or estimation that they could make of the time frame that it's been, they said back in way back in Egypt in the time of like like about 12,500 12, years ago, they said around the sinking of Atlantis around there, there was one priest that was able to communicate high enough to be able to, and they called them, they, they called him Rata, which like in their language meant Ra teacher. And that was like what they went by was the entity Ra. And isn't that funny how that was their sun god? Like, and that's how that blent through. And they said that that was distortion, that that wasn't meant to be. It's they, they distorted their teachings that they gave them. They said that they were, they feel responsible for us, as they said, because that they were naive back in that time frame and they decided to appear to us and communicate. And they said that they gave us the technology of the pyramids and they gave us the, you know, taught us all this technology and things for further spir spiritual development because they were extremely positive. And they said that their teachers, beyond them, did the same thing for them. And that's how they evolved as a species. And that they did not n understand that by giving us that technology that like darker entities or entities that wanted power would distort that energy and use that shit for bad stuff. And they said that they were responsible for what we would consider the secret societies and the Illuminati and things like that or the different names that we give them is because they hold a lot of that technology and understandings that they initially gave them and they use it for bad and horrible things uh, because it has to do a lot with time and energy and uh, consciousness and evolution and that's what they initially made the pyramids or that's what the pyramids were for. They said that they were for multiple purposes but we have lost that understanding or knowledge. And, uh, but, like, yeah, the, like, the first contact that came through, and this is really cool, because I just love this language, they said that, uh, you know, that they, they had, and that they used this language before we even knew what bandwidth was, and this is what they said, that they said that this communication is, is extremely high and has a very wide bandwidth, and this was, like, fucking 1970s, has a very large bandwidth which is a narrow beam communication. They said, so this is very hard to maintain. They said that the person who is receiving it must have a high energy complex that can receive this. And they instructed them on how that this communication could be made and more clearly done, right? And then they've kind of followed that. And then they started talking about what they were. They said, well, what do we call you? And they say, well, we prefer to have the energy sound complex of raw. They said, because that is what you previously called us in previous incarnations. And they said, Ra, well, wh why? And they said, the last time that we communicated with any kind of, you know, any one of your race or human beings on Earth was back in the time that they said that we have problems with time frames. And then they explained about, like, when it was of during the Great Pyramids and things like that. And they said, well, are you an individual or whatever? They said, we are a sixth density social memory complex that... Uh, would be the equivalent of the intelligence of a whole entire planet that is merged into one. And they said that they existed apart from time uh, and they always exist there in the place that they said that we would view a higher self would exist. And they said in those places that separation does not exist anymore, that we are all viewed as one and all consciousness of a species or idea merges more so into a oneness that individualism is all gained through experience but that um the consciousness is more one and so they would say and refer to it like every time that they would speak we are raw you know or i am raw and uh, then we'd go along with what they would say and they would ask them questions and just some of the things like i said like you heard how the speaking and the language um and this is coming through a southern, a southern girl that uh, just went to like community college, and there's like you know a social memory complex and the complex sound of this, and like like uh, that's why I love reading it because it's like wow, like this was the perfect, like if you could just describe perfect language, and even like, like all of the concepts that were brought forth, like merge with Casey's stuff, merge with a lot of other things, really expand upon it. They really talk about larger concepts that we fully don't really cover. They talk about like chakras and how that the chakras and seven chakras and a seven chakra system 
is based upon colors, and those colors coincide with sounds, which I found this out as well. And those colors coincide with geometries, that everything is based upon these, uh, these physical kind of, it's like a, um, a mirror of light, that everything kind of splits into that geometry, and that we're just like, that the universe is pretty much a mirror of ourselves, and just keeps on going into infinity, and it keeps on going within as well. And that we're moving through what they would call these densities. And they said that the each chakra is like a mini density represents to the larger density of what you're experiencing. They said that we were currently in the third density. And they said the third density was the density of choice, the density of polarization, and the density of um, will and actualization and choice. And so they said that, well, in, in individualism, and that we had to understand what it was to be an individual, they said because they, it's illusory that we're separate. But we have to understand the concept of what separateness is. And they said that all consciousness restructures itself and builds itself throughout each density. They said first density would be like planets and minerals and uh, things like that. It's just awareness. And they said that then that eventually shifts up to second density, which would be like animals and plants and things like that. And they said that that's more of the pack mentality, that there's no awareness of what an individual is. And they said the whole lesson of that density is relationship. Kind of like they said even by us taking in pets, that we subconsciously know that we're evolving those things faster. It's like they were trying to help us, we're trying to help them because they realize that they're not a pack. That because they see you and they have a relationship with you, that that starts to make them understand just by manipulating you, I'm hungry, I'm this and that, that they're an individual. And so that gets them understanding further to move up. And they said then we move up to the individualism, which they said is completely different structure that the whole entire, they said, energy complex of the soul has to be restructured to understand what it is to be separate. And they said that this structure is then going to be maintained through the next couple densities. And they said that you understand here that this is polarization. They said and this is where you go. This is the most important place of all because you pick your direction which you go. And that you either go to service of self or service of others. And that polarizing to one end or the other, they said, makes you partake in a harvest. Remember how Christ talked about a harvest? And he represented, like, said about, oh, about the harvest, about some will be taken, some will be not. They said that he was... What you reap is what you sow yeah, kind yeah. of deal? Okay. Yeah. And, but he was, they said that he was directly talking about something that we knew. They said that, and they talked about the procession of equinoxes, about like how it's 26,920 uh, 26, years. And they said they made an approximation because, like they said, the problems with time. So they rounded it to about 25,000 years. They said that that's called a cycle of karma. They said every 25,000 years is a cycle of karma, and there's a small harvest at the end of it. And they say that your karma is evaluated and your spiritual evolution is evaluated. They said that you don't physically like sometimes leave or anything like that, but you know it just depends upon the personal case. And that at each end of these, that you can either upgrade to the next density or you can repeat the next cycle of karmetic experience. And they said that each one is 25,000 years. They said that there's a grand cycle, which all of this is in the Mayan calendar, by the way, that you have these cycles. It's so funny uh, that they say at the end, which is the grand cycle, which is about... I mean, if you want to be technical about what we've discovered, it would be 26,920 years times three, right? That they said that there's a grand harvest. And they said the grand harvest is where the whole entire planet has to move into the next density or move where it needs to move or where it wants to move. And then your race or your planet is evaluated that if it needs to stay where it's at, go to another planet to experience because it didn't really graduate or move up to the next density on that planet. And they said that we were experiencing that and that that's why all the cultures pointed out 2012 because they said that that's where the window started to begin of the change and uh, what they would consider to be a harvest. They said that, they, that our planet was very unique and did not work like many other planets, that this experiment, as they referred to, is something way different than what most other planets experience. They, expl they explained that most planets only have one race and that that one race is much more cohesively connected and that they work together. You know, and they said there are some negative, what they call density planets that are completely like what we couldn't imagine, but that's by their choice. 
they said in general our planet leaned more towards the positive so that's what it decided to polarize as they said the earth desired even though it's been through a lot of stress and been treated poorly to they, they said that our our idea that it's more of a feminine energy is correct that that's been ingrained in our psyche that it is and it wants to move to fourth density but it's frozen and stuck because of our retardation and that our retardation is due to the fact of small amounts of negative entities repressing our idea of what it is and our own choice. They said because all of the things that repress us, we allow to do so. They say that it's not like anything that's opposing us is that we allow that to happen and we need to understand that process. And that they can only help through the law of free will if we allow them to help. And so by us being constantly stuck in fear that we will always have things that project more fear upon us. Because we choose by feeling that. We choose by feeling that, and by constantly being in that state, we choose to invite more of that into our life. Literally the law of attraction. And that we have to decide how to be more happy, and that allows the positive beings to help us more. It's because we invite them by positive thoughts. They said that we forgot how to create things, and that we don't know, like, we don't know what exactly we are, and again, they say that they feel responsible, so they hold themselves back from moving on to the next density until they resolve this, um, I wouldn't even say problem, they, because they never refer to anything in a negative context, which is really interesting to show how positive beings, that nothing's ever in a like negative context, is that we, as human beings, and this sounds really pitiful, <laughs> because when, they, when you hear it, they're like, around the first harvest, because they talk about, well, what, what did you do as a planet? And they're like, well, that they were very advanced and they were very super positive, more positive than a lot. That's why they're trying to help us out because they're extreme positiveness. They said they existed on Venus back when the sun was smaller. And they said in our time frames, that was like billions of years ago or millions of years ago. And they said that it got too big, scorched their planet, but they were long gone before then. And uh, they said that they moved up really quickly, that they were pyramid builders, and that was their specialty. They never really gained much technology because they never needed it. All of their communication was through... Um, Actually, they said sexual contact, that they express themselves through sex and love and understanding of each other, and that they built pyramids for their technology, which they were shown by their teachers that were way beyond them. And uh, so that was their specialty. But they never gained much technology because they never saw the need for it. And so that they said in their first harvest that, like, <laughs> what did they say, like one-third of their whole thing moved on to the next density, the second one, the rest moved besides two, which they said, you know, every possibility has to be expressed, that two actually moved to a negative density. Only two of their whole entire thing. Uh, which then later on that they moved to positive, but they reflipped because they did not understand what they were getting into when they went that direction. And uh, they said for us, they said the first harvest, we had none. Nobody was even viable. They said for the second one, People did move on, but it was very few, and they were so, like, everybody was so like, oh, why is nobody moving on, that a lot of the people that were able to graduate actually came back and incarnated again, because they were like the, what we would consider the ascended masters, they wanted to help, they wanted to help because, like, the harvest was so low, and they said that, uh, unfortunately, that that's what's been kind of the trend, was that a lot of us just couldn't make it, you know, and again, they like said that there was stages of history to where it was allowed for other things to come in and help us. But when you allow things to come in, depending upon what we invite, we invite positive and negative things. They said a lot of negative entities came in, a lot of positive entities came in, and just made this big mixing pot, which again, doesn't happen on many planets, that this is unique that because of the world that's chaos, and they allow the polarity of things, that, yeah, uh, of course, the dominant entities wanted to dominate. And the positive entities are passive. So who's going to naturally, like in a physical world like this, what's going to happen? Domination. And so that's what kind of became the trend. And we have to choose now uh, from this e unequilibrium of repression to choose positivity, which they said even though it's hard to do so, that it's actually more of an advanced path than a lot of other planets. They said, even though it seems like we're really retarded, they said the ones that do choose positivity choose it through such oppression that it 
it, it's more advanced. You advance faster. So you have the opportunity to crash and burn here and really forget everything. And you also have the opportunity to just extremely excel and really evolve more than what normally would be done in a short amount of time. And like some of the teachings through this are just so amazing. I mean, there's a lot of sadness to this as well because of what happened, you know, and like, uh, like during the whole entire thing, because like one of them ends up killing himself and it was the questionnaire. He ends up blowing his head off. Um, so that's the thing. But uh, that was because they even said that he, like he chose before he came into this life that he would start to have mental problems and start to go crazy at a certain age. And uh, they said it, it was coming. They even said that. They're like, oh yeah, it's gonna, gonna happen. You know, unfortunately you chose this. You know, and like gradually happened. He started to go crazy and uh, it got so incredibly bad that he didn't want to have all these other people taking care of him and suffering, so he went out back and blew his brains out. But yeah, so that's a thing. But, and I don't mean to preface that because this teaching is so amazing. Just like that is something that happened that stopped the, you're like, well, why isn't this readings continuing and things like that? That they really explained that it because it was so high vibrational that not many of us hold that and couldn't even channel that, that it took a whole group of people that incarnated multiple times together to get their energy to the point of being able to receive them again. That it was only capable of if they had that one guy, which was Don Elkins, Carla Roker, and her husband, which was the scribe that typed everything up. And they said the energy complex of those three was the only way that they could get through undistorted and explain, told them all these things that they could do to make the communication better. But yeah, that's one of the most intensive communications I've ever read. And like, like I said, like what they said, you know, because you take that in stride. And like, I've, I've sh I'm like, oh, wow, this is amazing. You should check into it. And some people are like, yeah, and I've only met like maybe one or two that actually will read into it and other people that are interested. But it's just like, it's like, it's, it's, I don't know. It's like something just like fucking steers me away. I've never seen anything quite like that. And they said it would be like that. And I, that's why there's only, they said there's only about like, according to them, there's only about 100,000 people that were currently in the United States at that time that were vi like viable energy enough to be able to receive that. And they said that it wouldn't be beneficial for anybody else to read it because it wouldn't resonate and it would hinder their free will. It would hinder their understanding. And they said so they won't be drawn to it because it wouldn't, wouldn't like help them in any way. So I, I'm interested in like, it doesn't mean that anybody's any less or any more because I don't want to ever say that. But sometimes people are in a certain place. Like some, some shit doesn't resonate with me that people just fucking swear by. And some shit does. And raw readings always have resonated with me. And I think it has a lot of the truth and meaning of the universe. And I've never read anything better. Ever. The only thing that I could even parallel close to that would be like Seth Speaks. In case he's cool. Case school for a good intro to it because of the recorded stuff, but nothing like those two. Like, those are beings from another place that are beautiful, awesome beings that I guarantee were our fucking teachers. And like where, where do you get access to these? Uh, actually, this is free. You can get this online. It's got loveone.info. I'll, I'll put it in my phone. Because, like, originally they wrote a book about it. Love? Law of One. Law of One. The number one? Uh, uh, no, just uh, O N E. And if you would like the Slash most. Slash info? Yeah. Or let's see, love one dot info. Oh, dot info. Mm -hmm. So where do, you, where do you see all this going? Where do you see humanity in like 100 years? Because I, I don't know why. I'm j it, this, this is leaving this. This is all leaving me extremely mind blown. Like yeah. I, I've been mind blown on podcasts, but this 144 guests, and I think this might be the most mind blown I've ever. Oh, this is 144. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay, that that's so, amazing. Um, that's amazing. Okay. It's exciting. It's exciting shit. No, uh, that's 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 but I, this couldn't be like, any more perfect. This is a, that's a that's a that's a sacred number. Did you know that? Why is that? Um, uh, look in the Bible when they said about 144,000. Remember that? Well. Okay, there's 144,000 is also a frequency number, which divides into the procession of the equinoxes. It was looked at through all entire history. It breaks down to nine, which nine is the, the, uh, the, representation, the representation of the creator. It is nothing and everything all at once. Tesla figured this out, 
is he said that uh, if we understood uh, if we understood what three six nine were, or the we would have the keys to the universe. And right, he always did things in three sixes or nines. He was actually so OCD he would never go into any store or any address that broke down to anything but three six or nine. He really found that important, and he said that he thought that that was the language of the universe. Now you go back into time. And like all the esoteric studies and things like that, those were the spiritual numbers. Um, that like when you add like all the other numbers together, right, you can't ever get three, six, or nine. No matter what you do. Like if you had, like there's a little thing where you add them to themselves and you never get them. It always skips them, right? You can only get three, six, nine by the means of three, six, nine. And when you draw them into uh, like a geometry, like how they, they, because they skip from like how they break down, right? And when you break down numbers, this is a numerology thing. It's really easy. And actually all cultures did this, and this is a big part of math, which we've kind of lost, is uh, easy. Like five and one break down to six. You just add five and one together, six, right? And you can go all the way up. 51 breaks down to six. Like 18 breaks down to nine. You know, you just keep on doing it. It's the simplification. Now, each number represents some sort of truth, and the, the truth is like what it represents in the whole faction of the creation, the separation, and back to oneness. What's really funny is like no matter how many times you do that, like the f each number times itself up into infinity, you never can get nine. Each number times infinity, again, you can't, don't get nine. Nine's the one that like you can't get. There's only special ways in adding three and six together that you can get nine that those are considered the spiritual numbers or the higher vibratory numbers that are come from a higher dimension. That all the other numbers, uh, when added to themselves, all equal themselves. And they make what's really funny, the way that they skip around when you go around the circle, they make an infinity symbol. So they just skip around like this, like bam, 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 kind of like that. And the other ones, the spiritual numbers, which sit above that, kind of, which I can show you a visual. There's a great video on this. They make a pyramid. And it goes three, it goes three six, nine, right? And then nine is the top of the pyramid, which represents the creation, the absorption, everything and nothing. Hmm. Because like if you take nine and add one to it, it breaks down to one. If you add nine to anything, it breaks down to only the number. Nine never existed. So it never exists, no matter what you add it to. You know, nine and six, 15, six. It always happens. Nine's a very special number in the way that that works, right? And that represents, that represents one and nothing. And so when you ever have a nine in something, it's the most spiritual number of all because it represents absolute completion. It represents the creator and it represents nothing at the same time. And so, like... Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now... The interesting part is that's hidden throughout all religion and all history. So if you ever see anything break down the nine or they put that geometry in there, it's for a reason. Even the procession of the equinoxes and things like that and planetary movements all tend to break down the nines. And they have specific sixes and nines and threes in them. So where does 144 play into this? Uh, 144 breaks down perfectly into nine and it's a perfect division within the procession of the equinoxes and the grand cycle that we're talking about. Which I didn't know that this was 144. So it kind of there's a synchronicity there. That is weird. Unless I miscounted, but I, I to be honest, I'm pretty confident that yeah. that's the right number. So that's badass. That's why that's I'm wild. Just like, yeah, like, because I'm really into numbers when it comes to those kind of things, and I think that they're important. Um, there's one thing like I I found that fucking shit out intuitively. Like uh, there was this one time. I just want to tell you about this because this was really interesting. I've never had anything quite happen like this. I've had some pretty wild shit happen in my life. But cool. We'll wrap it up after this story too, because I'm okay. starting to get tired. If that's cool with yeah, you, yeah, that's no problem. We've probably been talking for a long time. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I, I, you want me to look over real quick? Yeah, yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious. Uh, two, two forty four, three, three fifteen. Five hours. We've been 459. talking. Four fifty nine. Four fifty. And we talked an hour before this. Oh shit! It's one o'clock. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's crazy. I mean, granted, like, there's probably a good 10, 10, 15 minutes when we were upstairs. Jesus. Something like that. Wow. Yeah, that right? didn't feel like it. Isn't Holy that crazy? shit, yeah. No, wow. no, I was going to look over. I was guessing like 3.30. Yeah, I was guessing like anywhere from like 2.50 to 3.30 or something like that. And I'm, my God, wow, shit. Well, hey, that's great. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, But, like, here's the thing. 
is I'll, since I'll cap it off is that you were saying where humanity is going and I'll tell this number story and then we'll be done. Um, cool. I just think that through all of these things, you know, even though we see all this stuff that we're like, you know, we're not sustainable. We're really driving ourselves into the ground. I believe that that's true in the egotistical fashion, right? That like there's the surface of everything and that's where we're going. But also underneath it's a purging of s- the negativity to where we can let it go and move on to something greater, but choose it, to choose that. And literally to change, remember we were talking about the best tributary? We can literally change our reality by just shifting our perspective. And if everybody shifts their perspective, literally that is a reality that we do not accept anymore. We accept this reality. We can literally change the world by a decision. And we have to understand that. We can literally change our lives by a decision. Every day, if we choose to be more positive, we will bring more positive things. And that's all it takes, is a a a choice. Now, to understand that all this negativity exists for a larger fact of our own expression, our own choice, and that it helps drive us in this place towards something better. Because we see the contrast and we see what we don't want. So to be aware of the negativity is the key. I mean, people will have to go through the whole thing about hating it and being like, oh, you. But, you know, there's a lot of tributaries that were negative. We're one of those son of a bitches. And who's to say that we aren't living a parallel life that we are? You know, humanizing people. There's a reason. And I mean, even though it's horrible, and yeah, there are things that are unfathomable, we can't attach to that. We need to just focus on where we're going and where do you want to go? Where do you choose? And whatever you choose is you. And whatever you choose is okay. And that's what's important. is us to all remember who we are so we can reach our full potential so we are unhindered to choose our path. That we are unhindered. And whatever path we take is absolutely fine. And that's what we're here for. You know? is to, you know, a lot of us to experience, a lot of us to serve that greater understanding of what everyone wants. You know, I think some are solely here for that very thing. And it's all it is, is not forcing our opinion upon anybody or saying that this is the way or that is the way, but helping them be themselves so they can make a choice. Because a lot of us are asleep and a lot of us, not in the way of like the Christianity or like everybody, I'm woke or I'm asleep. It's more so that we just forgot. We forgot who we are. We forgot what we chose and where we're going. And again, that's our choice. So I believe humanity is deciding where it goes. I believe it's all as, all as changeable and all as malleable as a choice, an idea, and things like that. And we'll gradually see the unfolding of that choice and idea because that's what we require as a human consciousness is to make things make sense. You know, I believe that we also have the ability if we just let go of all of our belief systems to change everything in an instant. But we'd all have to agree upon that because we all partake in this reality and we all create it together. And, uh, yeah, so that. But, um, yeah, the, the numbers thing is something that was really interestingly weird that I, you know, I was counting the numbers and stuff and I just found this, like, this Tesla, well, I found it afterwards, but I remembered that quote and I was like, 369, you have the keys to the universe. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in my chair and all of a sudden, I felt like a really amazing tingle, almost felt euphoric, like I was on drugs, but I was on nothing. And I felt like, wow, like I feel really like this is strange. I wonder if I ate something, you know, whatever. And then I was like, I need to write this. I need to write something down on paper. I just couldn't get it out of my head. I'm like, I wonder what would happen if I took all the numbers from one through nine and times them by themselves and then all the multiples of that by themselves all the way up until about a specific amount of times. And all I think I went is like five. And then I wanted to see if I could see a pattern. And what I saw was amazing is that there's a geometry that's happening to where everything kind of intersects and goes two different directions. 
and everything builds up to a certain point, which it re reaches its peak around four and five, which actually have the same outcomes. They mirror each other. And that's how you can see that it like, like this, it mirrors each other, and then it goes like that. And so you have all these things, and you have all these patterns, but then when it goes back down, it mirrors itself, that you get all the same results backwards. And so they Interesting. do. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's weird. What am I seeing here? And then I noticed that when you times it, three, all the multiples break down to, when you times it. Nine. Nine. Six. Everything breaks down to nine. And then nine, of course, everything's breaking down to nine, right? It's the only ones that do that when you times it. When you do, like, you know, plus and do that multiples, you always get, like, you know, three, like, three goes three, six, three, six, three, six, and goes back and forth, jumps back and forth. And the same thing, six, six, three, six, three. You never get nine. Nine is the only thing that makes itself. But when you accelerate it, and this is, uh, I think this is just beyond knowledge because no one's figured, that everybody's figured that out. But, like, this is just something that came to me when you times it. When you think about what a times means, like, if there's motion, it means, like, to accelerate, right? So if you times it, that's when you get the nine. That's the only way that you can find where nine is, is by accelerating the path of three or six. And those are the only ones that could ever get there. And I know that sounds weird, but there's a lot of truth in that. Like, I think that literally that is the language of how you travel through dimensions and how dimensions work, is that you can always find the next dimension by adding threes. I think threes are very important. That's a, they actually use that magic. Did you know that? That, like, in, like, magics or any kind of, like, belief systems like that, they set things up in threes to manifest higher energy in because they believe that three is a window to another dimension. And that three perpetuates movement or abundance. And so a lot of people that are trying to gain abundance in life try to do things in threes. And then six represents balance, right? And six, rep six represents balance and unification of all sides, right? And so when you do things in sixes, and like again you see like the 12 apostles that's six and six and again 12 makes three you see again that that, that anything that tends to be spiritual because it takes two sides of balance which was polarity and then you have a three which is do it brings it back down but it perpetuated a certain movement you see they, they were using specific geometries to make like spiritual truths and this is throughout all religion and I find that so interesting that they knew something more that Tesla rediscovered so through numbers invoked higher energies that can be used not only for, again, technology that we don't understand and is perceived as magic, that we're understanding how to pull those energies in through numbers, you know, and using geometries to do the same. And that's like the study of cymatics, which we've all, you know, sound creates geometry. That's really cool. You can look that up on like fucking YouTube, is that you can just like take sand and put it on a little piece of paper and vibrate sound through it. I have seen yeah, that. Yeah, and I how have it seen makes that. those geometries. Same thing, you know, is that instead of using the sound, that the numbers invoke stuff and create the same effect. And so, like, that's really cool. And I just found, like, that was something that just kind of came through. And ever since then, I've, I've rediscovered that understanding through YouTube. And I was like, wow, it was actually, it was actually something. And that's a weird thing because I've never, never ever experienced something I've experienced other things like I said but nothing to where I felt like I was euphoric and then all of a sudden had to write something down and found that which was really cool I mean I don't know how I'm gonna use that in maybe this is it and maybe just the understanding is good enough but I don't know how I'm ever gonna utilize that I just think it's the language of the densities and I think it's the language of how everything connects to each other it's and weird that because you you describe it as like an intuitive message that almost came to you yeah came through you yeah you almost use this like a channel that's interesting yeah and that's the only time i've experienced that like that yeah and i wasn't on anything like i said it felt like i was on drugs it felt like i was like did i eat something what the fuck did i eat some bad food or something like that i was like i didn't know because right, yeah, yeah yeah because that literally felt like i was on drugs that's crazy yeah which then left after i did it um, but it was cool. It was fun for me. Uh, yeah, I found that other stuff. Um, you have a Facebook page? I do. Yeah. Um, just uh, feel free to like me or I can get that from you. Because there's a couple of videos that are just really interesting that are worth a watch. That okay. uh, are fun. Especially that one. That one's crazy. Like, uh, 
not not one that I. I do. would appreciate you sending me like any resources, honestly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a lot, um, like that. Uh, a lot of new information just came at me. A lot of things that yeah. I, I'm like, this is very fascinating. I just yeah. haven't heard much about it. Yeah. Again, these are things that aren't like really looked at because they're not in that crazy you know that realm that everybody kind of bats around is like this could be real this could you know whatever this is a very niche realm that not many people get into and uh i think you find it really interesting very yeah. esoteric and i like yeah it. uh there's a couple books that i would recommend to read and really gets into hypnosis and uh again proving the fact of all these people had different belief systems but all describe the same thing under hypnosis and really talk about life in between lives because one uh, one guy named uh, Michael Newton, um, hypnotist, decided to like vet out what he because he he was uh, I think he was even an agnostic didn't really believe in anything but he saw his friends got into you know past life regression and stuff and they had success so he without telling anybody kind of explored that and then did that until he found like oh wow there might be some legitimacy behind this. But he asked a question that a lot of people didn't, uh, else didn't ask because a lot of these people were saying that they reincarnated 100, 200, 300 years ago but then didn't have any incarnations in between and then would come back, right? He's like, well, where, where do they go in between? Where are they at? And so his goal was to get where they were in between that. And that's where a lot of like amazing stuff came from. It was called Life in Between Life Regression, and he got that. And like I said, he got a whole, we did like over a whole years and years of span, would do all these different people that all had different belief systems and everything like that, and they all described the same thing. And that's a really interesting book, and that's Journey of Souls. And then there's like, to take it to the next level, Dolores Cannon and Keepers of the Garden. She did something similar, but she found uh, a soul that incarnated on different planets. And uh, the preceding, I think that's a beautiful book. That's an absolutely beautiful book. It's one of my favorites. And uh, just really shows you how convoluted our universe is and how um, beautiful it is. And that, like, it's just as vast as we could ever think. Just we don't experience that much here because a lot of people that are here have been here and choose to come here for a long time. But there are people, things that incarnated other places and come here. It's just unlikely because vibratory differences and having to learn like how to exist here. He said because a lot of them like come from places that have never experienced fear. That there are planets that just are complete joy and never experience any kind of fear or anything like that. Utopia. Yeah. And so for them to incarnate here would be like a super trauma and would make them like and like I say that word catatonic, like a vegetable. And so that they have to learn what fear is. And they say that that's why it's highly unlikely that people don't want to, like, it's like laborious to come here or that people have to choose to do it as like a mission because it's so dense and there's not a lot of dense places like that. It says like for some entities coming into sludge. And, uh, and understandably so. Yeah. And so like it's interesting, the mechanism that the she explains on how they do that. And uh, it's one of the things that I thought that was interesting that not many people else other people talk about is imprints that they like like if you were to read a book to get better at something before you experience it right that they kind of do that with souls but it would be like an energy imprint that they take usually famous people from our timeline and choose to or people we sensationalize and like will energy imprint their life so it's like experiencing their whole entire life but not really experiencing it. Like almost like eating, reading an energetic book and then they come here understanding what fear or pain is and they're not traumatized. They said it's not like actually crystallized exp because they say we crystallize or actualize that experience and they said that that's the difference. But they say that that's how higher beings that have never experienced pain would, uh, would do it is they would take multiple things from our history and imprint on them and they said if someone was to actually hypnotize one of those entities, that their conscious mind protects them because they want, they're, you know, very protected. And they put forth those lives first because they're like, yeah. And so they may describe this whole life, but it's not actually theirs. And they said that that's how you can have multiple people saying that they're one person is because there's many entities that have came here, especially in this current time, to help. 
and they had to be higher entities to raise the vibration or help raise the vibration. He said it's just unfortunate because most of them forget who they are and because they're not used to being here, that they usually have uh, personality problems or things like that and have high anxiety and end up getting put on you know, pharmaceuticals and things like that and just forget who they are and don't do everything that they come here to do. And they said, that, but that's the chance that they take by coming here, and it's a volunteer process. And so, yeah, there's a whole, like, multiple, multiple books about that. And uh, that's really, like, some amazing stuff that I think lines up with, you know, Edgar Casey and things like that. If you really want to just, like, get the nitty-gritty of, like, how the universe works, I would say either the raw material or Seth Speaks. Seth Speaks is just fucking, I, when I say a riot, it's just great. Just, just great. Whatever this entity is, uh, has understands humans quite well, and has a great sense of humor, and is so, like scientific pound your face, quantum physics, everything, and way before its time, and is really enjoyable to listen to. So, like all of those things are, again, I'm super, super, like picky about this kind of stuff because I don't, I don't just believe anything that I'm told. I've, I'm very much discerning, and I only like. The truth definitely has a ring to it, and when you find it, it's amazing. And if you seek it, you will always find that. And I've never, I've learned more from those readings than I could ever learn from anything. Mm. And like, I could, I could go talk to the big, the greatest Swami in the world, and I don't think he'd teach me anything different than what was in those. And so, that's why, because they're valuable. I'm going to text you tomorrow about this and yeah. ask just like any book references, anything that comes to mind. Yeah, feel free. I could, I would consider it a favor, honestly. So Yeah, no problem. Uh, I'm going to be at work uh, tomorrow um, tomorrow evening. I sleep, uh, sleep in pretty late. But yeah, just text me, and uh, if I don't immediately respond, I'll get back to you, and I'll definitely text you some of those things. Cool, absolutely. Yeah, and just uh, if you want to, just give me a link to your Facebook too because that's another good modality. Fuck modality. <laughs> I pick a word and I just overuse it. A good – a good no, uh, I've noticed that about myself as well. I'll yeah, start uh, using words. Well, I don't even use that much. Like I yeah, was like I haven't used modality in such a long time. And all of a sudden, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was using excessive a lot. Like mm. This was like a few weeks back, but like I used it an excessive amount. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it's like that. You find that word for that day or whatever and just sort of like overuse it. I don't know. Right? Um, Do you have any other like last thoughts, though? I mean, I really enjoyed this. I hope uh, you enjoyed it as much as I did. I enjoyed this a lot. Good, 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 yeah. Like, it's funny how we, we kind of got hit on some of the points, but just kind of went off on our own little thing. But, yeah, we're, we're the creators of our own reality. We can heal ourselves from literally anything. And uh, just using that stuff and sometimes, like, taking stuff away. Like, I, I fa that's one thing I didn't touch on is I fast a lot. And I think fasting is uh, like the feast and famine thing. I think that that's a necessity for human beings to clean themselves out. Okay. Yeah, and uh, that's one of the things I wanted to get on kind of for health, but we kind of it doesn't matter that we skip by it. It's it was in the cards. I'm I'm pretty much I'm living in Springfield until oh when is it December 14th I believe, and then I'm going back home and I'm going back home for like permanently to St. Louis. Oh, St. Louis, huh? Yeah. So between now and then, I may hit you up again if you'd be interested in doing another I'd one be, of these. I'd be so interested. Yes. Maybe even me, you, and David. Like who yeah, knows? Yeah, that'd who be knows? a lot of like, fun. Yeah. So I'm I'm get, like I'm pretty much trying to prioritize my time to get as many of these in as uh -huh. I possibly can, but I would love to have you on again if yeah I, man you sounded like, interested so I'm down oh yeah definitely I enjoyed this so yeah very much uh, again like this it's not always I don't know like I just I've learned these things and this is definitely like not always what I lead with with everybody because like there's some really wild stuff in here uh, I just like. I mean, if I live for the next 10 years, if I live for the next 100 years, I I just think that it's so incredibly valuable what I've gained personally, and I think that there's so much to offer for every individual person, and that's why I recommend these things. But again, I, I would have to say for those readings, you'd have to suspend a lot of your disbelief because it's such an intensely, you have to accept that these people are channeling something that is telling you that your universe is like a speck and there's so much more going on than what you're even aware of. It takes humility, lack yeah. of ego. And yeah, that you exist in so many different ways and they just love you and they just want you to do the best that you possibly can and that they feel responsible for you and that we're not doing so well. 
and that's the thing that nobody really wants to hear is we're not doing so great, you know. Well, how about, how about this message? Yeah, we could be doing better. That's which I think most people th- could that's buy into. That, that's what like that's what they pretty much say because they always keep it on the positive that you've chose like like most of you have chose a positive path and da 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 and they're all trying to do it, and they always try to keep that on the positive. But I know I, I'm putting my little slant on it. It's just it's just like comparative. Like I'm like whoa damn, like we are the retarded children of our fucking galaxy. But uh, <laughs> that's it. I mean, but you know some of them have the greatest heart and really learn. And that's that's the thing is we have the opportunity and we have the opportunity to make our lives beautiful. And so that's my mission. And that's what I've been on lately is just making my life as beautiful as it possibly can. Having faith that everything will turn out, that I know the answers, that we know the answers and that I don't need anything. I don't need anything to exist. I can just exist and be happy. And if I fucking fucked up my chemicals, I'll find the things that I can find to change them. And that's what I've been doing. I've I think that fucking. I always thought I was going to be damaged from all the drugs that I did. And I always thought that I was going to be depressed because I suffered from depression most of my life. And you know, in the past fucking year, I've got it to where I can get off everything. And I'm happy. I'm super happy. And I found that through um, a lot of Ayurvedic medicine. I found that through fasting. And I found that through, it's amazing what, how, you, how you can repair and like what it feels like to be happy. Like, and again, it's mostly by choice, but through those choices, you find the f- things to fix your physical self. Like you say, action, you know, because sometimes you have to actualize that thought and, you know, it re- we require physical actions. I'm not just going to be like wallet in pocket and it gets in pocket because we require this to make things make sense. So like if I made that choice to be happy and I really, truly believe that I can, I'll draw those things to myself that will do it. And like I think that that's happened, and I did. I wouldn't say that I didn't believe because I did, but uh, when it happens, you're like, yeah, yes, you know, it actualizes. Like, yes, I'm actually finding something. I'm actually, I actually did. Like those doubts that you have in your mind, you're like, you actually did perceive something. You actually did create something, and um, it's happened so and too many times. And uh, I'm happy. I'm happy to know that. Those concepts are real. Those concepts work. You just have to believe in them and you just have to do them and not doubt them. And you have to believe that you can. And that takes a lot of will. And, uh, yeah. Just that's the whole thing is don't, it's going to sound funny, don't be a pussy. Just do it. And when you do that and take that mentality, that this place is a place that you need to be kind of hard. And that's what a lot of people do. It's like, I'll be oversensitive, really pushing oversensitivity lately. We don't need to be that. I mean, we came into a place like, you know, sludge. We came into that. We need to act like we're warriors. We need to get through it. We need to push through it because through resistance creates great change. It's the catalyst. It's a catalyst for our movement. And like, I even find that through diet. Like, again, through feast and famine, you put your body in a high stress situation, it evolves. And you do that even with yourself. You test yourself constantly. And by facing your negativity or by doing certain things, by giving yourself rest, by giving yourself movement, everything, it's just a balance. But you need that duality to function here. You can't just be all la-la-la because if you're all la-la-la, you're, you're, not, you're not doing good. I agree. Yeah, I and, agree. And uh, that's it. So even though we, we can create this beautiful euphoric utopia in our life, you know, we, we have to work towards that. We'll eventually get there. Because you can. And that's that's it. That's the density change. That is the heaven on earth that everybody talked about is when you become the creator of your own reality and you decide solely what your creation is. And that's a whole other level of consciousness that is right here. And it's that simple. It's empowering. It's yeah. encouraging. And it advocates for free will. Well, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think you've Thank blown you. my mind more than anybody. So. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I appreciate it. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that we spoke. Uh, I really enjoy talking to you. Same. Same. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, cool. That's it. All right. Damn, son. <laughs> that was a Six hours. Run. Yeah.